Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the PG Podcast. I'm Mark Bridge, and I'm here with Zach Wojner. That's me. And this is our final phase uh, of the Marvel talk until we hit Endgame, which is going to be a special thing. Um, because from what I'm hearing so far, that this is a movie to watch, and I can't wait. Like, I'm... I'm like shaking <laughs> in anticipation for this thing. Um, I get to see it tomorrow night. Um, Zach, when do you get to see it? I'm seeing it on Sunday morning. Nice. Uh, 8 a.m. So. Bring in coffee to the movie theater. <laughs> well, I'm seeing it. Technically, I'm seeing it Friday night, 2 a.m. Friday morning, 2 a.m. It's th- still Oof. a Thursday show. It's 2 a.m. I had to actually go to the theater to buy my ticket because they, the websites wouldn't let me. <laughs> and it, it's actually three hours, right? Yes, it is from what? You're saying. not getting out until after five. Yeah, I know, right? But hey, I stayed up longer and seen, you know. Heck, I watched, uh, last year I watched the Beyonce concert at 2 a.m. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> and that was a two-hour concert, so. Eh, it's nothing. Um, but, yeah, uh... Talking about these past Marvel movies just really showed the depths, the depth of how, you know, Kevin and and company have crafted this MCU and um, uh, how vastly different these films are Um, coming from phase one, which obviously, you know, played it safe for the most part because, you know, you want to get people invested uh, in this universe without trying something crazy. Um, but of course, yeah, I guess the craziest thing is the Avengers movie by having all these team up, uh, all these other leads from other films team up for this one big event. And it worked uh, so well for them. And then uh, go- going for, from that to phase two, which had its growing pains, it, pains, it still had its um, its leadership, which is Ike Perlmutter. And then uh, you still had the creative committee to, 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 to deal with. I mean, they're job was to make sure that every film was cohesive and you know seed things for future films um but what that did was for the most part hamstring some of their filmmakers and storytellers um some directors were were able to escape that which you know including the russos and and james gunn was they were able to escape that whole uh um i guess uh leash that the creative committee and Ike Perlmutter set for the MCU. But, um, something crazy happened. Uh, similar to the first film in, in the, in phase three, there was a civil war at Marvel. Um, number one, a lot of things were happening, uh, behind the scenes that I, I think Kevin wasn't, didn't like like for instance Iron Man three the main villain was supposed to be a female and my in my Hansen and you know I was like no that doesn't sell. Um, there was this big announcement, this big shebang uh, at the El Capitan, I think it was, where they announced Phase three films. And if you look at that announcement and look at the actual films we got, a lot of things were <laughs> quite different uh, in the in the release of that, right? Still waiting on that Inhumans movie, right? So Inhumans, so basically what was happening, I, 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 and I actually wanted to do a sort of docu-series that actually goes more in depth into this thing, but um, with the MCU sort of getting Disney and Marvel this big cachet, right, they realized, well, we don't necessarily need to promote the projects we don't own the rights to, uh, namely Fantastic Four and X-Men. And if you were if you were reading the comics at the time, you could tell that there was a shift going on. Uh, number one, Fantastic Four got canceled. Now they could say it's poor sales, but come on, that let's be real. They didn't own the rights to to Fantastic Four, the film rights, so they didn't want to do anything to promote their competition, which was Fox. It was a war. Um, X Men was selling too well for them to cancel X Men, but at the same time, they really sort of cut a lot of things down. First of all, a lot, you know, 
if you go back to the 90s and even the early 2000s, there were at least six to seven X-Men titles being uh, published. But then they shrank that down. Well, I mean, that could be looked at as a good thing because, you know, when you had too many X-Men comics being published, it felt overwhelming. But they cut it down for because they wanted to stop promoting X-Men. That's number one. Uh, even though I love the storyline of Cyclops becoming like Magneto, evil, that was their excuse to sort of kill off Cyclops. Uh, spoilers for people can't who catch a break. Go. Then they kill off the most popular X Men of them all, Wolverine. I mean, how do you do that? They kill them off, and basically they made in they started to dwindle the mutant uh, race basically, uh, and then Inhumans started to pick up speed in steam in the in the comic books, so that it could lay the foundation for when they introduce Inhumans in the movies. So that it more reflects uh, the MCU when they eventually did the Inhumans. So they were pushing the Inhumans both on the big screen and in the comics. So Inhumans was one of those films that were announced. And they put them on TV. <laughs> and then, you know, a lot of stuff happened and they, they canceled that for the movies and put it on TV, which was a critical disaster. Well, even before then, on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Right, I think they played such a big role starting with season two. Yeah, um, and, and 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 they were like, "We're not the X Men," and then we're just like, "Like you're forcing them on us." Yeah. Uh. So, so that was one thing that happened. Uh, another thing that happened was a, a deal was struck with Sony when they had their d- disaster. Well, even though Amazing Spider Man two made a lot of money. It was critically panned, and it was... And it didn't make enough money. Yeah, and it, it looked like it was going to be a case of dimin- uh, diminishing returns. If they had continued on the path that they were going to try to continue, it would have been a disaster. Like, they, they basically used Amazing Spider-Man 2 to launch their cinematic universe. You know, they wanted to do an Aunt May movie. They wanted to do a Sinister Six movie, a Black, uh, a black Cat movie, um... A Morbius movie, Craven, which they're still doing, <laughs> but not to the extent that they wanted to do. Um, but uh, uh, a leak, a recent leak. Well, it was you know, around 2014. There was a was it 2014, 2013, 2014. I think there was a leak, um, Sony leak for with their emails. I think that's because they wanted to do that uh, Seth Rogen, Jane Franco movie. <laughs> the interview. Yeah, the interview. And, and then the know, North Koreans North... got all pissy about it. And they were like, all right, take that, Sony. And basically leaked all their emails on the world to see. And one of those, in those tidbits, there was some talks that Sony wanted to team up with Marvel with their Spider-Man property. But... Uh, either it was it was a talk between Kevin and and and, and Amy, but I think Avi Arad didn't like that idea, and kind of put the kibosh on that. Um, but then it was out there, and I think maybe it was because fans really wanted that, or maybe it was higher ups on Sony that was never really made clear that. Uh, maybe it was the top execs at Sony said, "Wait a second, the Spider Man thing is working. You had something in your." You had a way to make some uh, Spider-Man work, and you didn't take it. You better take it. And at the time, Amy was basically the Kevin Feige of uh, Sony. She was the president, I think, at, at the time. And she got demoted. I mean, she still had held a high position in Sony, but she got dropped from that position. And then... It made a, it was made official that uh, a deal between Disney and Sony has been struck for the Spider-Man character, and that's that uh, uh, Marvel will be able to use um, Spider-Man in their MCU, and Sony will be able to use the MCU characters in uh, in the Spider-Man movies. And then the deal also, so basically it is this is it. So Sony basically has. Uh, control over the release and financing of Spider-Man. And they reap all the benefits, the profits, all that. 
but they pay Marvel to produce the film. So they give Marvel the fee to to basically write, direct, all that stuff, and they put it out. But the profits profits goes to Sony. I mean, of course, you know, Spider Man is still a Marvel property, so they get their licensing fee or whatever. And all that merchandise. Yeah, uh, and all that stuff. So that works out for them. So they, uh, and the, the merchandise was a big part of why uh, Sony wasn't making any money on the movies beforehand. Right. Uh, because they wouldn't get any cut of any merchandise, even if it di- like directly pertained to the movie. Right. Um, and But when Spider-Man is included in the MCU films, Sony gets no cut of that. It's all Marvel. So they, they reached their deal... Uh, amicably and you know and everybody was excited um then kevin and co wanted to do a civil war movie but that would include extending the contract of robert downey jr which was had only one film i think left on the contract um and it would cost a lot of money for them to do it but it's disney but ike was still like why should we pay robert downey blah 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 like it's like he, he can't seem to remember that Disney is now the overlords of Marvel and they get they have all the monies so that shouldn't be an issue but right but some guy who wears a suit wants to pretend like they're the boss so right. he's gotta swing his tie around right <laughs> and then but so I guess Kevin had enough and Kevin went straight to Alan Horn and and, and Bob Biger and said listen uh, we need to restructure this whole thing. Um, you know, right now it's the MCU that's making all the monies for you guys, right? MCU plus merchandising, Pro- uh, basically propelled by the MCU, not the comic books, not television, the, the, the studio itself that's making the money and the mar- merchandising. So how about we skip the middleman and make the, the Marvel studios its own entity that answers only to you guys and let them over at Marvel Entertainment do what they want to do. And Alan and and, um, and Bob said, sure, why not? You're making less money anyway, whatever. So Civil War caused the divide between Marvel Studios and Mar- Marvel Entertainment. So they became two separate entities. Yes, they're still Marvel, but really, in reality, it's two separate entities. And... The first thing that Kevin did was disbanded the creative committee. He threw him in a pit of fire. <laughs> so uh, everything. R.I.P. Ho, Joe, Joe Casada. Yeah. So everything going from Civil War on forward was all Kevin, his creative team, because he does have a creative team. Make, mark, uh, make no mistakes about it. His creative team, and the directors and the stars, and that's that. That was it. Uh, Robert was got signed on to do two extra films that's with Spider-Man and Civil War, uh, plus whatever his obligations for the Avengers were. Um, so the first thing uh, out the gate, uh, Civil War, which we're going to talk about, which is the second film by the Russo brothers, um, and our introduction to two other superheroes. One was Black Panther. By the way. Before the Spider-Man deal, Black Panther was supposed to serve the whole Spider-Man. Because in the comic book, Spider-Man was like the central figure of, of, of uh, the Civil War, where it was like the war was being experienced through his eyes. At first, he signed on with, with Tony. Then he realized what Tony and his cronies were doing wasn't up to snuff, so he changed sides and went into uh, sided with Cap. Um Black Panther was supposed to be that role because they didn't know if they were ever going to get Spider-Man. Uh, so they wrote two scripts. Th- I mean, do you think it was actually Black Panther in that role? Because I remember them saying that like they had another character who they kind of never really said who it was. Who was gonna like? I think Black Panther was always going to have the role that he had, but I think that Spider-Man would have been, you know, could have been well, someone else. Well, the way because. If you're going by the El Capitan release, right? You know, once they finally announced Civil War, and they had uh, uh, they had Chris Evans and Downey come out together fighting, and they said, "Oh, the guy that's going to be stuck in the middle of this 
Mr. Chadwick Boseman, or New Black Panther. So basically, in essence, they were trying to say the central conflict would involve uh, some sort of moral morality decision from Chadwick Boseman. And of course, I he mean, said, I, I think yeah. that that happens in the movie yeah. itself. Yeah, it does. But I mean, maybe you're right in that they were they had another character in mind to sort of serve the, the Spider Man. Uh, well, Riri wasn't even a thing then. Well, but she had to have been, you know, in the, you know, on her way yeah. to being put in comics by then, right? Didn't, when did she make her debut? I want to say, well, yeah, well, 2015, but remember... Well, we're, were talking about Riri Williams, yeah, the who is like Iron Little Heart. Iron Man. Yeah, Ironheart. But I, I want to say Riri... Because there's, there's a lot of Peter Parker in that kind of character and you can like i could see it very easily just uh you know if you switch him out and instead of uh spider-man powers she, he's she's got you know iron man powers mm -hmm. and it would also a lot of the complaints in both that and spider-man of peter parker basically being like his suit being an iron man suit yeah. almost well, would be not an issue if she was a little iron man yeah well Riri ironheart aka ironheart she was introduced in 2015 um, and you gotta remember these movies are being worked on like maybe like two years out. Like Cap uh, Civil War came out in 2016, which meant the script would have probably been in the works during 2014, uh, around 2014. Yeah, a little bit of 2015. So as much as the MCU have remained faithful to the comic books, it's I I, I they've never sort of day in day in sort of like oh something was just introduced in the comics it's right away in the mcu you know um so i don't think it would would have been riri but uh, but either way uh i remember watching the commentary for it was either it was avengers infinity war or civil war one of them where uh the russos were talking or or it was it was mcfeely uh marcus and mcfeely were um they were talking about how when they were in their office with the Russo brothers sort of crafting their story that Kevin would just once in a while come in and say one word, then leave <laughs> as to indicate, OK, we got this. Do do something with that. And they were just working on it. And he worked, <laughs> he walked into the office when they were working on a draft without Spider-Man. And he, they walked in Spider-Man and walked out <laughs> and it was like, oh, shit, we got Spider-Man. And then they added him in later um so yeah uh the version of civil war that we got we had black panther and spider-man as our new characters um and no origin story for any of them uh by the way this was like pretty brave of well we've seen spider-man's origin tales so many times it's like okay that's fine uh it's just about how they would introduce his character um in the mcu like will they delve into his origin tale or would they just pretend that he's been around you know because then you would you the question would be like where has he been in avengers age of ultron where has he been in the other films has he been around of course they just put it in the script that uh he's only been spider-man for six months which would which would put his uh him becoming spider-man after age of ultron um, and I mean, and even if uh, it was before, you know, he wouldn't be in the same league as right, the Avengers. Right. He's not even in the same league as Daredevil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the suit is literally pajamas. Yeah. Right. But I guess so is Daredevil's in season one. Yeah, season one was this. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then you have Black Panther. How would they introduce his character? Would they go in his origin tale and everything? Which they didn't. But um, they sort of just say, pull, push it off like, this was your first taste of the fact that it's an inheritance, not necessarily uh, bitten by a radioactive panther or something like that. It was just some sort of <laughs> uh, sort of passing passage down to from king to king. Um, but enough story revolve around both of these characters to make their inclusion organic into the movie. And... Um, so for the longest, Civil War was 
to me, the best, not my favorite, but the best MCU film at the time. My favorite at the time was still uh, um, from Phase 2, which is uh, uh, Guardians 1. And then, of course, so Civil War had everything. It, it Even though I loved what they did with Age of Ultron, a lot of people see Civil War as Avengers 2.5 and sort of an apology for Age of Ultron. I don't see it that way. It's just Age of Ultron exists on its own, but Civil War, it's its own thing. Um, yeah, I, I see um, Civil War as, and Phase 3 in general, as like the real, you know, Avengers movies notwithstanding, mm-hmm. like the birth of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a universe, yeah, uh-huh. where the movies can cross over. Like Captain America is not an Avengers movie, yeah. but it was kind of marketed as such mm-hmm. because it had so many characters crossing over. Right. And like, aside from like the like super brief cameos, like Bruce Banner in Iron Man three, uh, or Cap in um, uh, Thor two. Mm-hmm. They never crossed over in their solo movies, right? For for more than like one minute, and Phase Three is all about uh, Cap- uh, Captain America co-starring Iron Man, uh, uh, Thor co-starring Hulk, and with Doctor Strange in a minor supporting role, right? Uh, Spider Man co-starring Iron Man, like that's what mm-hmm. you know. Phase Three. Um, set that precedent yeah where kind of um what what everyone was saying about guardians of the galaxy oh you know tony stark's gonna end up in space yeah like, no not in phase two in phase three in phase four maybe yeah <laughs> we'll see what happens um but yeah it uh, it really that movie just was the most successful captain america movie the, the sort of end to his trilogy and like the second film, which kind of turned the MCU on its head when they revealed that S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, was Hydra, this one split the Avengers apart and sort of created the Sokovia cards. Even though I, I sort of have beef with the Sokovia cards thing. If you don't watch Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D., which deals with the Sokovia cards a little bit, um... If you go by any film that takes place after Civil War, it doesn't really talk about the Scovy Corps in any of those movies. There's no ramifications, really. Yeah, is Doctor Strange registered? No. Right? <laughs> Shit, even Doctor Strange, it's very up in the air when that movie takes place. It's never really sort of been said, okay, is this movie before Civil War? Heck, is it even before Age of Ultron? Because you could put it before Age of Ultron if you wanted to. Um, but, uh... Well, but doesn't he doesn't he have the thing with, uh, don't they mention Captain Rhodes? No, that see, that's a thing. Or is that a thing where it's supposed to be, but then Kevin Feige in an interview is like, oh, well, it's not Captain Rhodes no, because, it, uh, blah, blah, blah. Right, it's not, it, it does mention an Air Force someone from the air force that needs who broke some his sort. spine so who else would it be right but i think they were saying no it's not Ro- it's not roadie um that wasn't roadie it's supposed to be roadie yeah uh, i mean the timeline is extremely malleable right we'll see if there's something in endgame that fixes that <laughs> there won't be probably not but uh, <laughs> you know we just have to accept that in an, a cinematic universe there are going to be not even plot holes just out and out mistakes. Mm-hmm. Spider Man. Like it's, impos- <laughs> it's impossible to reconcile Vision saying that it's been eight years since Iron Man, and uh, Spider Man Homecoming say that it or Spider Man Homecoming saying that it's been eight uh, what eight years, years since Battle of New York. Six- right, and then yeah. and then in ca- in Civil War he says it's been six years since Spider since Tony came out. Yeah, even though so a lot, so a lot of people were trying to fix that timeline. Oh, maybe yeah, they were trying. I actually fixed. I actually fixed it, you know. And I don't. It's so easy. It's so easy. Simple. Iron Man to Avengers takes place in one year. Because, hmm. I mean, th- those three, you know, Hulk, Iron Man two, and Thor take place at the same time, right? Which I think is super cool and more... I think that they should do that more in the future. Like, you could say... 
you just push up you you push up uh those movies to like 2011 right right uh all yeah that's what i'm saying (laughs) but everybody was trying to say no this movie is is like dude come on it's not that difficult Mm. iron man phase one is one year that's it (laughs) um but yeah so uh civil war uh uh broke the avengers apart establishes sokovia accords um uh, introduces to Black Panther and Spider Man, which we'll see late. Uh, see their films in in the MCU. Um, what else did he do? Uh, uh, Baron Zemo. Uh, I actually like Baron Zemo uh, as a character. Sounds great. Um, well, his name is not Baron. It's, <laughs> he's Helmet Zero. Hel- Zemo. Helmet. Helmet Zemo. Um, a special Hel- forces. <laughs> Helmet is a funny name. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I know uh, you know cultural sensitivity, but your name is Helmet. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we got more on uh, on the relationship with uh, Vision and Scarlet. You know, beginnings, the seeds being planted for their relationship. Um, and, of course, uh, saw the, the tragic ending. Like, see, that's the thing when a lot of people talk about how Avengers Infinity War, that's a part one. You know, they said it was going to be a standalone, but it's a part one. They say that because of the ending, right? But Civil War kind of had a downer ending, too. The Avengers broke up. Helmet won. He's, like, Thanos isn't the only villain that won, right? Can we only call him Helmet now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, just checking. Yeah. I, I am okay with this change. <laughs> so, he's the, he, he, he won first. He's the first... A villain to win, you know. He got yeah. it. He wanted to destroy the Avengers from the within, which Ultron wanted to do. Uh, but Helmet succeeded. He broke them up, um, and you got yeah, the and, and 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 it's it's not even a you know Infinity War and Endgame are not a two part story. Like you can clearly see, you know, just by the title, especially back when it was Infinity War parts one and two, yeah. Civil War. They both have the word war in it. Right. I mean, that's, you know, it's the same director. It is clearly, you know, the Avengers go from Civil War to Infinity War. Mm -hmm. uh, And then Endgame, which I keep on calling (laughs) Endwar. And now I wish that that was the name of the movie. Right. (laughs) Keep that war theme. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's the MCU. We're kind of almost at the stage where even when they are self-contained they're not really self-contained right <laughs> um, you know, there's so many threads and and especially now in um phase three we're at the stage where we can make these kind of like ad hoc trilogies in our head mm-hmm. and be like you know oh captain marvel is a guardians of the galaxy prequel yeah um you know iron man 2 you know, leads into so many other movies. Mm -hmm. And even thematically, you could see it as a prelude to Civil War because of the whole thing with um, uh, Whiplash, his whole arc of treating Mm -hmm. Tony as the villain. Right. And there's so, there's just so many uh, ad hoc trilogies you can make out of the MCU. Mm. Um, There's so many through lines that the different movies drop and then pick up. Right. Heck, you could see, you could say, Winter Soldier leads into Age of Ultron, leads into Civil War, <laughs> thematically. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. I, like my my favorite is Iron Man three to Civil War to Spider Man. Oh, oh, uh, interesting. Because you can see Tony Stark abandoning his powers, mm-hmm. being dragged back into it, and then trying to pass it on to an apprentice. Right. Now, I'm waiting until I see Endgame, but I wonder if this could be a trilogy as well. Avengers 1, Avengers Infinity War, and then Endgame. If that could be, especially considering that all three films have Alice Silvestri's score, I want it to sort of uh, be that sort of package deal. Um, But yeah, uh, one thing though, that Phase 3, a lot of questions are brought up in Phase 3. This one particular. If you weren't on board with the MCU from the beginning, would phase, th- would phase three be a good start? Right? 
if you weren't on, well, in a lot of ways, Phase Three fulfills like the promises of being a connected universe because of all the stuff that we were just talking about of yeah. having these characters pop up in each other's movies. Uh-huh. Like Phase One, especially, you could look at like you know the superhero movies of the day, mm-hmm. like of Daredevil, Spider Man, X Men, Fantastic Four, etc. Like. If you if if all of the connective tissue flies over your head, if you don't recognize Clark Gregg that he's playing the same character in all of those Phase One movies, mm-hmm. it could go completely over your head that they're supposed to be connected. Right. But by Phase Three, you know you've got Iron Man popping up in every friggin' movie. Right. Uh, and you've got Doctor Strange playing an important role mm-hmm. in uh, Thor. You know you've got to be some kind of ignorant to not go oh wow it's all connected man well and, and, and when i mentioned like if it's if it's a good idea because i remember when civil war came out you know the question was can somebody who's never seen a marvel movie watch this movie and understand what's going on right like the answer is no right like, like there's so many characters who we've dealt with their origin tales in previous films their dynamic was already established so then would you feel the impact of the team imploding if you've never seen an Avengers movie, if you've never seen a Captain America movie, if you've never seen an Iron Man movie? Do I you mean, know what the stakes ways, are? In some ways you can, and in some ways you can't. You just, you get it. It's not as bad as, say, uh, Infinity War. Right. Where you, you know, by design, you have zero context for these characters mm-hmm. before you meet them. Uh, and, like, that is great. Like, I love that the movie says this isn't – if you haven't seen it, this isn't for you. Yeah. So <laughs> deal with it. Yeah, sunglasses. Uh, but Civil War, I think the first hour takes its time enough that you get to know at least a very broad picture of who everybody is mm-hmm. before they blow up. Like I know I, – I have a friend who's like 60 – three or something and she was the movie reviewer for the cleveland plane dealer mm-hmm. um she recently uh quit her job so she's fine she's doing fine now she's retired or something nice. but she was reviewing civil war and she hadn't seen any mcu movies wow she was like maybe i saw iron man or maybe it was spider-man she's just not a superhero person right. at all right uh and she want and we we like talked about it afterwards because mm-hmm. she was like, I don't, uh, like, yeah, it was fine. I got everything, but, uh, I don't know who that is or that or that or that or that. Right. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, but did you like it? She's like, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a thing where a lot of the fans worry about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we go, oh no, you've got to watch this, this, and this first. Yeah. Yeah. Where you don't really like, yeah, yeah. You, you, should you? Yeah. But is it the end of the world if you don't? No. Like, a great example, I'm watching right now. I was about to talk about that. I'm watching Game of Thrones. I'm watching, (laughs) I I was at a party, and they were, the the season premiere was on, and I've never watched Game of Thrones before. I've seen, like, one or two episodes. Uh, I saw the pilot, and then one episode just randomly. Mm -hmm. And I watched the season premiere, and I was like, huh, this is pretty cool. The The Winterfell is under siege. The White Walkers are on their way. They're marching on the town, uh, and everyone's kind of stuck together. It's like the Alamo. It's like Assault on Precinct 13, and I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm going to watch this. I'm not going to go back to the beginning. <laughs> I'm not going to watch every episode from the beginning and read the books and yeah. everything. Like, I'm wondering, but, uh, so I got to ask you, because I've never met anyone who's ever seen a later MCU movie. I can't get there sort of like take on it like did you get it like are you missing some some things how is the story working for you so as someone who's just watching season eight of game of thrones how is that working for you how how attached are you to the characters how does the narrative flow for you i have different context with these characters like stuff that's um especially in episode two Mm -hmm. there's so much stuff with uh the characters kind of regrouping after having been apart for so long or sometimes even like meeting for the first time right and i don't know who any of these people are but i get to know them through these interactions right i get to see them 
when they are at their best because things are at their worst. Mm -hmm. So I don't have I have very little context for like why everyone hates Jamie. Yeah. Like I know he pushed the little boy out the window. That was yeah. in the previously on Game of Thrones. Yeah. And I actually remembered that from the pilot when I watched it like a million years ago. Right, right. Uh, but like I don't know what he's been through since then. He looks really different. Yeah. Uh, he looked like a pretty boy in season one. Now he looks like a haggard veteran yeah. uh, with only one hand, which should totally be made out of dragon glass, right? Because then he could karate chop. Yeah, so, right. So. Who knows? They might be <laughs> give him one, but it might be too heavy. I don't know. Whatever. But like, like everyone hates Cersei. They're like Cersei's so bad, and I'm like, is she? If you tell me she's bad, I believe you that she's bad. But I haven't seen her do anything bad. I don't know who she killed. I'm sure she killed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But like, I just see her. You know, she sees uh, her boyfriend, and she's like, hey, do you want a whore? Do you want a queen? And then they bang. Yeah. And I'm like. She seems like a fun lady. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. You know, at some point, I'm sure she'll show her true colors and be bad. Mm -hmm. But she seems like uh, someone who's got the throne has not proven to be a bad leader, as opposed to Daenerys, who set the poor fat guy's parents on fire. Right. Uh, so that's what I was going to ask you, too. Like, what do you think of Daenerys? She's going a snake. <laughs> she's a snake in the grass. Jon Snow better watch his back because she's going to stab him in it while right. he's sleeping. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm just curious because like we, we we don't have all you don't have all these sort of baggage that we brought like when we were watching Daenerys we were rooting for her yay and well, cause she, yeah. like I know from the video game because I played the Telltale game uh -huh. <laughs> which was my introduction to Game of Thrones playing the Telltale game <laughs> uh, that she like freed all the slaves mm -hmm. with with her dragons or or before she got her dragons no with her dragons with her dragons but they were still so, like, babies. At the time, and it really wasn't with the drag. It was th with she had the armies, the Unsullied. She mm -hmm. mainly utilized them to free the slaves. So, like, she has, you know, she did a good thing, but I don't think she did it to be good. I because she the way she talks in this episode, the uh, episode two, is just like, I am sing. My only goal is the throne. Mm -hmm. That's all I want, and I will cut through anyone and do anything to get it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all of the good things that, she, that that they say that she did, you know, what if she's not altruistic? What if she just saw that as a stepping stone towards the throne? Yeah, yeah. She's a backstabbing, backstabbing <laughs> snake. Yeah, that, that's Set her on fire. That's, so I'm curious to see how, when it's, when it's all done, how what's your reflection on this the, the season would be. Uh, I'll check back with you on that one. That should, that should be its own podcast. Yeah. You should, you should cut out this part of the podcast and make it like an episode zero for... <laughs> Or Game just this is yeah. this is the Iron Man two of the podcast, Iron Man two yeah. seeding <laughs> future podcasts. Yes, yeah. we're seeding the future. It's yeah. right here. Yeah, all right, round so, zero. So then we move on to our next movie. Now this is the movie that Kevin Feige himself said when he started the MCU, he couldn't wait to get to. Like the day he gets to do this movie will be the happiest day of his life. Which is ironic because I think it's the weakest in the Phase Three films, <laughs> but I still enjoyed it. Um, that's Doctor Strange, um, and they cast Benedict Cumberbatch, which I think was a shame that they didn't make him use his English accent because I thought that would have been a perfect way to go about. It's like why not make him British? It's, they've changed so many things in the MCU, you know, where, where there's uh, gender changing or race changing. Why not nationality changing? It's like, Doctor Strange is British, so who cares? I should have asked that. I interviewed Benedict Cumberbatch mm -hmm. for The Grinch. Right. And they talked about, um, he told me about how when they were, they were doing the movie recording, they told him to use his natural accent. Right. And they did it for a little bit and then decided, no, I want to do an American accent. I feel like this character is so American. Uh, Dr. Seuss is American. Uh, even though uh, Boris Karloff, who right. played him in the, the cartoon, was mm -hmm. not American. I think he did it. Didn't he do an accent? I don't remember. That, I don't remember. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but it was like his decision to do an American accent for the Grinch. And now I'm wondering if he was like, you know, this character, its roots, you know, his roots – uh, the way I read him, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm sure he read a bunch of comics to prepare. Maybe he decided, you know, oh, 
you guys don't you know don't mind if I do a British accent, but I really want to do an American one. Right. I and, wonder if that's not the case. And the thing about it is too, a lot of his mannerisms would play better coming from a Brit. You know what I mean? Like when he's talking about Beyonce and stuff like that. You think, okay, because he's talking about Beyonce, he has to be American. But I watch a lot of these British shows where they talk about pop culture and it just seems more funnier coming out of their mouth than an American, you know, talking about pop culture stuff. And I felt, I feel like a lot of the jokes would have landed better uh, if he was um, British, like. You know, it would even sell the arrogance a little bit more, make him less of a Tony Stark copy, even though I don't think he was a Tony Stark copy in the movie, but it would be a snarky character with a different flavor um, if he kept his British accent. I don't know why they they didn't do that, but I still enjoyed his performance uh, regardless. Uh, um, I enjoyed the film. This is, I guess, the, the last origin movie in phase three um oh well, we've got uh, captain marvel it, but it didn't really play like an origin film it you know she was already captain marvel in the beginning of the movie yeah it's well we'll, we'll, we'll get to captain yeah. marvel but but one of my favorite things about it is how it handles that right <clears throat> so but this i would say okay this is the f- only traditionally structured one to three act origin story of MCU in Phase Three, you know. Yeah, when, definitely. When the movie begins, he's just a doctor, um, which they had to do, right? It, they couldn't. I could. I, I don't see a way. I mean, well, there is a will, there's a way, I guess. But um, why tie yourself up that much when it, it was just easier to just tell a straightforward story? If yeah, this... I mean, we've seen it a million times by now. You know, even going back to the Incredible Hulk, like we talked about uh, before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just in terms of storytelling, do you want to tell the story or do you want to do all the legwork that ta- that you have to do before you can tell the story? Right. Like think of the amazing Spider-Man doing all that legwork that we already know and doing it in such a rote paint by numbers way right. before telling its original story, which is a guy turning New Yorkers into dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> but – um. You know, and we we see it in, in Incredible Hulk. We see it in Captain Marvel. We see it uh, in Black Panther. Mm-hmm. You know, the character is already established, but we get context as the movie goes on. Like, at, like at the end of Act One, you know, they ha- they'll have like a flashback right. or a scene where they sit around and talk about everything, right? Uh, because you know, you need that momentum going in, mm-hmm. uh, and why waste it with you know regular people. Right. In, in in that way yeah. and i and i think that dr strange i think that maybe that's kevin feige being like this is a movie that i've been waiting to make let's make it like the the last traditional superhero movie right um and so this is the film that blatantly talk about magic um, you know, you had the pseudoscience talk of the Thor films. Uh, Thor The Dark World, I guess, deals a little bit with magic, but they they, they don't explicitly see, say magic. Because if you go by the Thor films, clearly Frigga, Fri- uh, Ren- Rene Russo's character, she taught Loki her her magic stuff, you know, illusions and all that jazz but they still never really came out and say magic uh this one yeah anything that as guardians do we like assume is is a science that we just don't understand you know was it clark's third law right uh but this one just straight up jumped straight in it's it's all magic but it also introduced the concept of i guess multiverse um the mirror universe that is not our universe it's just a universe that they can just manipulate things in uh, and not affect our world so this was the introduction to that which i think might even play a part in endgame who knows um uh but i like the idea that is it, it takes some concepts of inception i was especially when you watch that first trailer it was like oh it's inception in marvel universe awesome 
I mean, a lot of people might say it's derivative, but you know, I thought that, I think that was like a good way to sort of, um, sort of ground this magical universe to people who seen that movie and enjoyed that movie. Is like, oh, you know, I get, I, I, I get to see a mental image of what they're trying to establish in this universe. It's kind of like Inception. And even then, it's just like a visual starting point. Right. Like, it gets a lot more psychedelic. Yeah, and then speaking of psychedelic, you know, in the comic, the original comic uh, created by, uh, was it Ditko, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee? Um, the two characters that Steve Ditko did was Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Uh, so in the, the Steve Ditko created this whole psychedelic comic book. And they wanted to sort of infuse that into the film, which I think to some extent they did do that, you know, from the very first time that uh, um, Strange meets uh, the Ancient One and she does that whole karate punch. I mean, that's the best scene in the movie. <laughs> and he just kicks his, his astral form out of his <laughs> real form and goes on this astral journey through the different universes. That was so awesome. And then you see a character that a lot of people thought, oh, is that Thanos? Oh, no, but it turns out to be Dormammu. Um, and I love the, the the final act of that movie. That was, this was one of the films, other than Ant-Man, that kind of turned the third act on its head, where it's like something drastically different. With In a traditional movie, you would see explosions happening. This one is happening in reverse. <laughs> the... The buildings are getting put back together. The cars are flipping back into normal, <laughs> normal stage. So that was pretty cool. And then the way he dealt with Dormammu, Dormammu, I've come to bargain. You know, it was an awesome scene. And you know what's so funny? So Dormammu does not look like that in the comics. The MCU has this magical things of making changes that would normally piss fans off. Other than the Mandarin thing, because, you know, you can't escape that. But for the most part, the changes they made from the comic books, it's like... Well, what does he look like in the, in the comic? Is he like a guy? Yeah, he looks like a dude in a armor... In armor, big armor, skull and everything. Yeah, um, we've got enough of those already. Yeah, it, I mean, it, I guess it'll probably look too ridiculous. Let me see. Let me remind myself. He was the main villain in one of the uh, Capcom versus Marvel games. Um, oh. Here, let me see. Thor. Mamu. Um, yeah, he looks almost like Ghost Rider. He had, his head is on fire. Um, he has big armor on. Like, he looks like a souped-up Ghost Rider, pretty much, in the in the comics. He should be in the Ghost Rider movie. Well, he's been in the Ghost Rider comics. He's been in Thor. He's been in uh, Doctor Strange. And he's been in uh, the Ghost Rider comics. So it's like one of those villains that's entertain- interchangeable with the sort of uh, magical, spiritual characters in the mcu or in the marvel comics so yeah um so yeah they change him to almost look like a big cloud monster which would have been like what the hell are you doing this again no but you know what they pulled it off what can i say <laughs> it worked yeah it worked it worked um, i mean because he still got to talk yeah <laughs> yeah that's the thing played about by benedict cumberbatch, benedict cumberbatch. <laughs> um which I don't think we'll see the last of Dharmamu. He's he's definitely gonna come back for future Doctor Strange films, but um, Doctor Strange and Ghost Rider. Well, I hope. Well, because mm, the idea before we heard the the them announce like films for uh series for the Disney Plus channel, a lot of fans were kind of hoping that the next Doctor Strange movie would have Scarlet Witch in it, where he's training her. And this would be like a prelude to the House of M storyline or something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, you could have different characters in his movie. I know another popular character, which I think is the daughter or sister of Dormammu, which is Cleo, I think her name is. Um, um, she's a love interest of Doctor Strange. But then they already have a love interest, which is... Yeah, but uh, she sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she did. She had a small role, which technically, I think that that her character was 
what the character of Rosario Dawson in the the Daredevil shows, Marvel Netflix shows, was supposed to be Night Nurse. But, yeah, I remember seeing like the Screen Rant articles of like, oh, well, how can they do two night nurses? And I'm like, it, it, it doesn't even matter. Like, it doesn't yeah. even play into it. Like, yeah, so who? No one calls anyone night nurse ever. <laughs> so don't even worry about it. Well. In Jamaica, the term night nurse was being used for prostitute. <laughs> oh, night nurse. Well, we should all be. We should all be night nurse. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, Doctor Strange. You know, I wonder if Stanley knew that. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, a great film. Like, I just got back from Jamaica, and I've got a great idea for a new character. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, Doctor Strange, great film, um, uh, awesome special effects. It's play, uh, played it safe, pretty safe, you know, because it, it being a sort of traditional three act, and you had it's to. A li- it's a little too much of a kung fu movie, right? Well, that's the thing. I, I that's the idea I was trying to think of that they should go because the animated movie that came out like maybe two or three years earlier. Um, I think you can still watch it on Netflix. I believe that actually played like a sort of um, kung fu film, uh, just with magic. And I said, "Yo, that's the way they should approach it. They should approach Doctor Strange like that." Um, which it, it's a thing where where they make so much about his ability to use magic, and everyone can do magic. Yeah. But all they do is make like swords and whips out of magic, right. and it's like <laughs> it, it's why I love his fight scene in Infinity War. So much because it when really like, went balls to the wall with it. Yeah, right? when he creates all of his clones and yeah. they use like the whip on him, and he makes yeah. the, he turns his projectile into butterflies. Yeah, and I think that that's so good. <laughs> and like I like kung fu movies, right. but I think that uh, Doctor Strange should not be the avenue to do a kung fu movie. Right. Well, they're, later on they're gonna get their actual kung fu movie with Shang Chi, Shang Chi, mm-hmm. yeah, who yeah. I've never heard of. Yeah, but um, like do I, it. Yeah, I've read. He's showed up in a, in some of the comics that I read, but I've never really followed him. But um, definitely, uh, uh, I can't wait for that. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see if they ever give Iron Fist another chance. But like, you know, probably. that should have been their avenue to do that, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, stop. That's strange. Lovely, lovely film. Um, but then now uh, we get to James Gunn. 2017 Gunn's... is like the best year of the MCU ever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Guardians, which started out the year. Um, that came out in April? May. May, May, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, May, uh, Guardians Ga- Galaxy Volume 2. Not as good as the first one. Better than the first one. <laughs> That is, well, okay. Saying it's not as good as the first one doesn't mean it's like this one. This first one is here and this is down here. It's like fear, right? It's just something so beautiful about the first one that I, I give it the edge to. Um, like I felt the balance of story and hijinks was better in the first one than in the second one where the second one was just like every scene there's some hijinks involved in every single sort of scene and then all the way to the end um that could potentially be distracting um like for instance i saw the scene in the trailer and i thought it would have played better watching in the movie but it just didn't the scene where yon they're escaping the main ship and yondu's shooting the super arrow and they're falling down and they're playing what song was playing again come a little bit closer by right. jay and the americans right um i thought it would play better but it, i get i mean it's not a bad scene it's my favorite scene in the movie but, i love it it's so good but it, it's just the uh, you know whatever you know but like um it's yondu taking back what's his and also erasing his past like, like for instance, right? For an example, go going back to the first Guardians, right? When they're fighting the Dark Esther, and uh, Ronan is sending some of his uh, minions to bomb Xandar, and then 
the the uh the guardians with rocket and some of the ravengers sort of like go down and they aim their ship up this sort of that was like a serious moment that never really played for laughs like it was that time to be serious about it so you kind of felt the impact on that every single scene including the third act had that whole wacky hijinks moment you know like you never really felt the tension as much in the third act um in in the in volume two still enjoyable but you never felt that that tension that's why i felt like part one was a lot more balanced than part two again not taking away from part two I just felt that there was more of a balance. It felt part two felt more uh, on the line of some of those cool Disney movies that I used to watch back in the day, the Disney cartoons that have fun, laughter and seriousness all wrapped up into one movie. Um, that's kind of like feeling I got when I watched the first guardians. While this one was just like, how many more jokes can we throw into this movie? Um, and at the expense of some of the serious moments in it. But again, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved more of the fact that we expanded the universe to including it to include like these new races, um, the sovereign, you know, they were pretty <laughs> interesting, especially when they're doing the whole carpet robot for her and they <laughs> get stuck. <laughs> stuck. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sylvester Stallone playing the original one of the original guardians um technically i guess uh um what else michael rosenbaum uh and miley uh, cyrus. michelle yo yeah miley cyrus um, ving rames yeah like an like a 10 foot tall ving rames yeah um oh yeah it was it, we got another look at howard the duck <laughs> yeah. yeah so i love uh, guardians of the galaxy 2 is in like my top 5 mm -hmm. uh maybe maybe even my top 3 like, I think that it does – it's funny because I think that at times the first Guardians is a little bit too standard. Mm -hmm. I, I don't love the the big fight against the Aster, the Dark Aster, mm -hmm. at the end uh, when it, you know, is caught in the net and then it breaks through the net. And then it's like – I don't know. Uh, and, and I do feel that way a little bit about Volume 2 um, where – I think that there are like five too many explosions in the last 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I think that it, it, it does everything that the first movie does and it pushes it all as high as it can possibly push it. Right. Like it is more action packed, but it's also more emotional and it's more, I think that um, a great thing that it has is that it doesn't need to spend time getting these characters together right you know it's the thing that that everyone says oh the first they say about every single sequel ever the first one is more fresh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well and sometimes sequels fail because they try to do the same thing as the first one mm -hmm. uh and i think that this sequel volume two it it said it picks up basically right where the first one left off right and it says we made them a family now they have to deal with that right like they can't just be like oh rocket you're so wacky um they have to go, wow, Rocket, you're an you're asshole. asshole. <laughs> uh, and we need to, you know, but but you're also our family, so we need to whip you into shape mm -hmm. or, you know, find out what makes you tick. And that's like the whole movie is it's, it's Rocket's movie mm -hmm. in, in a sense, because um, while Peter Quill is, you know, finding his real family, mm -hmm. uh, Rocket's kind of abandoning you know they're both peter and rocket abandoning the family that they have uh rocket to be alone because he thinks that that's what he deserves mm -hmm. and peter because he thinks that he's got a dad who loves him yeah uh and rocket you know through his interactions with everybody especially yondu mm -hmm. realizes oh my god you know the classic it's been right here all along yeah, yeah. uh and like the very last shot of that movie before the credits is him crying because he lost someone who he loves. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, my heart. Yeah. So I, good. I, I, uh. I guess that's one thing I'd give this uh, volume two an edge over vol volume one is that it is a lot more emotional. Um, but again, it's building off of what volume one established. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like it is not as fresh as volume one. Yeah. Or or Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Like. But it knows that it can't be because nothing can be as fresh. You can't do the same thing twice and expect the second time to be more 
fresh. Uh, and so it does, I think it does it one better because it really dives deep into these characters. I think that if there's like a, a short, if someone draw, drew the short straw, it's probably Drax. Right, yeah. Like, I'd love to learn a little, like, we get a little bit of it. There's a great bit where he's being, you know, he's being Drax, Mm -hmm. and Mantis grabs him, and then she just starts crying. Yeah, yeah. Because she uh, is experiencing, like, the heartbreak and pain that he's dealt with Mm -hmm. ever since his family died. Yeah. And it's like, he's not crying, but he's, you can see it on his face, because Dave Bautista is that good of an actor that he's just been dealing with it for so long mm-hmm. that it doesn't make him cry anymore. It just makes him feel empty. Yeah. And and seeing her cry is like, oh my god, you're dealing with this every second of your life. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure that we'll get some more of that in in part three. Yeah. Uh, especially now that James Gunn is back. Oh my god. So happy. I was I you know, we talked about this a million years ago, yeah. but um, I was. I was I've never had any interest in going to Disney World mm-hmm. or Disneyland or Disney theme park because mm-hmm. I'm like there's the movies and, and you know all the stuff that we like and then there's like the merchandising right and Disney just Disney World just represents you know give us your money mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. represents that side of Disney yeah so you know what let's talk about it a little bit since we're in phase three here and we don't see any other place we could actually have this conversation yeah we talked about it before. So, the whole James Gunn thing, you know, him getting fired over 10-year-old tweets, tweets that Disney already knew about, tweets that he apologized twice about, um, but of course, we were living in this whole outrage culture, so Disney, for whatever reason, they felt, oh, shit, we gotta, we're, we gotta let this, this guy out, go. This outrage culture where, you know, alt-right hacks, mm-hmm. like Mike Thernovich. Yeah. <laughs> Can can just drag something out that that people have already known about and weaponize the liberals, my people, mm-hmm. weaponize their outrage, uh, and, and make us go, oh well, that James Gunn he made an appropriate joke, so I think he should be fired. Uh, I don't know. Do you think pedophilia is funny? It's like, well, when you're joking about it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Um, and yeah are they good jokes no no they're not (laughs) do i laugh at them usually no sometimes yes (laughs) um heck not even not even comedians are funny on on twitter like i've read a few tweets from actual comedians and they're like yeah i see where you were going with that but it's not funny (laughs) yeah and and if someone you know but like comedians know that and i've I've interviewed comedian i interviewed colin quinn and he said, you know, the people make jokes that I don't like all the time. And you know what I do? I don't laugh. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're going to make another joke, and I, maybe I'll laugh at that one. Yeah. <laughs> but am I going to go, oh, you shouldn't make that joke, and you should now be fired and die? Like, <laughs> no, that's not how we handle these things in a civilized society. Right. Like, and, and, and are his jokes hate speech? No. Like, pe- like people compared... Uh, James Gunn to like real pieces of garbage like yeah. your Ben Shapiro's and your other like alt right fucking pieces of shit <laughs> and like if you're putting them in like the same pantheon you're just you're doing it wrong you're doing liberalism wrong right you're my people but god damn it you people <laughs> um so Whew. so he got fired let let go and people thought oh wow it will be the end of if gun, but because it was such Disney didn't anticipate so much support for for uh him coming back that the, you know they didn't anticipate that number one as soon as he left all these studios wanted him and Warner Brothers got him to do Suicide Squad which I'm actually looking forward to yeah, um, uh the the cast of 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 Guardians all wrote that letter. And especially Dave. Dave went in on Disney. Like, uh, like the respect, I think the respect for, for Dave went even that much higher. Number one, like, the fact that he's doing such great work in, 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 in film. You know, like, uh, even if it's a small role, like, in Blade Runner, he, he takes that character and actually makes it a meaty character, right? Um, uh, you know, and then the fact that he's defending James Gunn to the end, like... 
and don't even care that it's Disney. Like, yes, it's his biggest role ever, but come on, this is a guy that left WWE at the, the t- height of his career because they felt he felt he they weren't doing right by him. Did you know the story of why he left? Like, I know. And wait, the last headline I saw was he punched Ric Flair. Well, well, no, nah, that's. That's or is that, that's more recent. Okay. Yeah, it's a recent thing, and that was but yeah, I that do. was storyline. He was on one podcast or another talking about how he wanted to be the next John Cena. Yeah, and they were like, "No, we're not going to let you be the next John Cena. You could be the bad guy, right?" And he was like, eh, "I don't need this." Like basically, because you know WWE have their own studio, they were giving John Cena all the roles, um, and then what happened was Dave says, "All right." giving him all the roles i'll just do these other movies that they, they give him which is they were b movies but he didn't care you know what i'm saying they're, they're, they weren't films that came out in theaters it was just straight to uh uh straight to video stuff but he's doing it on his own terms and they didn't like that it's like okay you're you're out of the the wwe brand when you do that stuff we want to control that aspect of your career as well and he was like nope i'm out um yeah, I mean the WWE is such horseshit. Like, I, I understand people who like. I've I've never been a fan of wrestling. I mean, at I'm all, a ever. fan. I love wrestling, but, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but like I completely respect mm-hmm. uh, people who are super passionate about it. Because like I'm passionate about stupid shit. Yeah. Like I'm passionate about like like half the video games in my collection are just like ridiculous. <laughs> like, like why do I love Bionic Commando, the 2009 version? It's like I could explain it. But I don't have to because I because I, I just love it, and like and people love wrestling and they can defend their love of wrestling and they're they're very passionate about it and that's like the important part, mm-hmm. especially since they're also they're not these like apologists for the bullshit of wrestling, mm-hmm. like they're they're people who raise money for wrestlers who can't afford surgery, mm-hmm. and people who uh well, who's that guy with like the 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 greasy hair who everyone hated and they tried to make him a star and they were just like fuck you dude roman reigns (laughs) yeah like he was going to be the next big thing and the community just rejected him Mm -hmm. because they could tell that that the wwe was just trying to turn someone into a star regardless of their merit yeah and i don't know roman reigns maybe he's a great dude no idea that's the thing he was he was a great dude a great wrestler it's just the fact that they were his push was not organic. It felt it like it was. Reeked, it reeked of that like corporate yeah. synergy. Yeah. So people are like, no, no, we're not buying it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think that dis, you know, bringing it back to James Gunn, I think with me, my anticipation for Guardians of the Galaxy three went from like one hundred percent to one percent. Yep. Yep. And and my perception of the MCU went from one hundred percent. To like fifty one percent. Yeah, um, and my perception of Disney went from like fifty five percent to like two percent. So here's what I think happened. No, so so before I, I get to that, I want to say it was the day he got rehired, right? I was just reading, just doing my own thing, and then I I, I clicked on. Uh, one of these uh, websites, I don't remember which website it was, but I saw James Gunn rehired, and I started laughing. My, I just laughed. I just started laughing. I was just, like, laughing. It wasn't like, yes, or anything. I just started laughing, right? I'm like, why did I laugh? I don't know why I laughed, but it's just a strange reaction to something that I, I was excited about. And the reason why I laughed is because you can. I saw the writing on the wall, right? People. It, it was soiled by the, when when Disney made the decision to let him go. It blew up in their face immediately. Where where the the, the actors were like, "Nah, dude, what are you doing?" Uh, uh, people in the film community who weren't even affiliated with Disney were saying, "No, what are you doing?" Like I remember, I think Joe Carnahan said, "Like what? It, what? Why did they let him go? That was stupid." Um, so, Joe Carnahan, I love him. I'm just looking forward to. He's not directing it, but uh, his new movie is coming out like the week after Endgame. Wait, which one was that? Um, El Chicano. Oh right, I did see the trailer for that. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of uh, people in the film community, and of course, a lot of 
film fans, it was like majority of us anyway. You still had the outliers it's like, yeah, you should go over there. It's like all of a sudden they're against James Gunn. It's like, oh, he's a pedophile. He's a pedophile. I was like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, you've uh, got like, I mean, because you've got these right wing people who are happy to shut him up because they care about free speech, except for when they're the ones being criticized. Right. Uh, but they're able to weaponize that towards like, you know, again, my people, but the snowflake people. Mm-hmm. Um, who who will hear anything and then go, oh, I can cast judgment now. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, aha, I'm better than James Gunn because James Gunn makes jokes about pedophiles. <laughs> uh, so he must be a pedophile. Do you think pedophilia is funny? Do you think it's funny? I have a family member who is pedophiled. Uh, <laughs> so, like, do you think it's funny that that happened to him? And it's and And no, obviously no. But also, you're taking it and putting it in a completely other thing. Yeah. Like, that's not what anyone's saying. That's not what James Gunn is saying. Uh, you know, he's trying to be provocative. Uh, and, he, you know, again, he apologized for it a million times. Um, and, but you, but we saw people go, oh, my God, Disney, Alan Horn, or Bob Iger, whichever one. Um, you know, what is wrong with you? Can't you see what's happening? Can't you see how, like, the alt-right did a hit job on James Gunn because he criticizes the president? Yeah, it was... Uh, and they were like, no. And, and I think part of it is also, I bet, you know, a lot of stakeholders in Disney are, like, from what, you know, coastal elites refer to as flyover territory. Mm-hmm. You know, the middle of nowhere where there's more cows than people. And I think... Um, and I think what was going on too, it was still right in the midst of the whole Disney buying Fox deal too. I think they didn't want want to sort of disrupt that because this is before it all got solidified. Uh, it, the bid went through, or was it before the bid went through? Because they were still in competition with Comcast. Well, but obviously, you know, uh, yeah. R- Rupert Murdoch and Donald Trump are best friends, right? So, in it, yeah, they were dealing with that and. But anyway, like, it, you know, it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go, you know, <laughs> with 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 people canceling James Gunn, you know, uh, uh, even at the time too, Sony was the movie that he produced for Sony. It was supposed to debut at the um, Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con. Um, and Sony, in anticipation of the fallout, said, oh, let's let's, let's uh, postpone that. But then they even themselves saw how well received James Gunn was being, you know, like, like oh, shit, maybe we could still do something. And then later on, they released the trailer. The movie looks so good. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. So so Disney is seeing this. Disney was seeing the, the, the reception he was getting. They saw that Sony didn't cancel him. They saw that Warner Brothers hired him and realized, yeah, we probably fucked up on this one. Um, so... So and then these are the things I'm purely speculating here, but I, I you know, I'm sure it's probably some of it is, is also correct that other filmmakers that they even though they said they didn't look for other directors to direct Guardians, um, I'm sure other directors were like, we're not touching that with a tenfold pole. Mm-hmm. Uh, this belongs to Guardi- uh to James Gunn. It's his baby. He should direct it. So I, I'm sure they anticipated that kind of fallout. Like who? Yeah, wants I mean, to... and I think they tried to save face by saying, "Oh, but we're still going to use his script, though." Yeah, and that just made like they thought that that would be like, "Oh, well, maybe it's better now," because uh, you know his DNA is still there, all over there, like a Jackson Pollock. Uh, but then they, everyone was just like, "Well, that just makes it worse." Because how or can you say, "Oh, we we don't like James Gunn anymore, but we're still going to use his script, mm-hmm. but we're not going to let him direct." Yeah. Why? To what end? What are you even? What point are you even trying to make anymore? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they ultimately companies will, you know, big, you know, multi-billion-dollar corporations will never make the right decision based on doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. But if they do the right thing based on financial interests, then I guess we can still call it a win. Yeah, yeah, um, and I think maybe even. Because I remember we were saying how comes Robert didn't say anything? Like, why is he keep keeping silent? I, he may have said some things, too, just behind the Who? scenes. Robert Downey Jr.? Ah. 
Yeah, he probably said some things too, like, what are you guys doing? And he doesn't have to put it out in Front Street. I'm sure his cachet is large enough where he can actually have a conversation behind the scenes. And it I means would something. Love to, I would love to think that that's the case. I, you know, I will neither praise nor fault him mm-hmm. because we don't know. Right. But, like, there is the chance that there was behind the scenes talks. I'm sure Kevin Feige did behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, I know he probably he definitely did it. Yeah. I know he, he definitely. You know, Batista immediately, you know, it's good, you know, that you mentioned that someone like Batista, we love him so, mm-hmm. but it's hard to imagine that he has that much pull. No. It's hard to imagine that he can grab Kevin Feige. But I mean, he can literally, you know, rah. <laughs> But uh, that he can, you know, tap him on the shoulder and be like, hey, can we talk about this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Kevin Feige would be like, no, you are you are a tool. You are, you know, we, we you're an actor. We, you're disposable. Remember Terrence Howard? Me neither. <laughs> um, Josh Dallas, that once upon a time guy. Who? <laughs> um, but some, you know, Robert Downey Jr. has the clout to to do that stuff and he doesn't have to do it in public. Yeah. yeah, Batista doesn't have the clout to do that stuff in private, but he can win over people by going public. Public, yeah. Chris, you know, Chris Pratt pissed me off because he was like, "Oh, I have to prey on it, uh, whatever." <laughs> but uh, and even Dave Batista was like, "I don't have to prey on it." Yeah. Um, but at least he signed that open letter that they mm-hmm. put out. Mm-hmm. So, so Chris Pratt, your church is weird. But, oh, yeah, I did see a little documentary about his church. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're weird, weird freaking white people. You make us look weird. <laughs> um, but but ultimately, I do believe that he did the right thing in signing that letter. If he hadn't signed it, I'm not saying that if he hadn't signed it, James Gunn wouldn't have been brought back. Mm-hmm. But if he hadn't signed it, uh, Chris Pratt would be pretty canceled. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, so it was strange, right? Right before he got rehired, I noticed something, because I think the, the Endgame poster came out before the announcement that he was uh, getting rehired, right? And I noticed something on the poster. It said, executive produce, well, James Gunn, as one of the ex- executive producers. I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, well, I don't think that they'd be able to take him to remove his credit from that. Well, they can, um, if he's not I, I, the creator, they can remove his... Because they did that with Andrew Kreisberg, I think his last name. The Warner Brothers guy who did all the WB shows. Okay. They took his name off of executive producer, but they, his name still comes up developed by or, or created uh-huh. by. They can't take his name off because he did right. develop that. But, oh, oh, although, you know, I think... Um, I remember reading that the last few episodes of Supergirl that season were weird and they were weird because they redeveloped the storyline separate so that it wasn't what he had come up with uh, so that so that they could take his credit off. Oh, uh, got it. <laughs> like cuz there's some weird stuff in the last couple of episodes of Supergirl season yeah. 3. Yeah. Um that I liked uh, because it was so unexpected, but was also like, I'm pretty sure this is not what they had planned. And then when I learned about that, mm-hmm. I, I read some other headline that said that they rewrote a lot of the last few episodes so that they could take his credit off. Yeah, yeah. Inter- you know, interesting the way they do it. Yeah. So, yeah, so the saga is, you know, he's back, and I can't wait for uh, Guardians 3. He's get to f- Victory! He gets, to f- he gets to finish it. And we, we get a bonus movie. We get... Suicide Squad too. I know he bridged the gap. He, <laughs> he took he took Marvel fans. He took DC. He took Marvel fans and he took DC fans. And oh, oh. <laughs> now we love each other. Yeah. So um, uh, it's nice of Disney to sort of give him the the le- <laughs> this guy the leeway to finish Suicide and then work on guardians and the thing is most of the work is already done for guardians but the fact the script is written so they just gotta they just gotta make it yeah so and like i'm okay with it with them taking a little while you know 2014 2017 uh you know we might not see it till 2021 or 22 yeah. i think this was one of the movies that we were originally supposed to see uh, next 2020 but 
Yeah, probably won't see that until 21 or 22, one of those. But, like, you can let them breathe. It's the MCU. It's a whole you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, when, when I remember they're like, oh, we're not going to get Iron Man 4. Mwah, mwah, mwah. He's in the Avengers. He's in Captain America. He's mm-hmm. in Spider-Man. What do you want? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not going to get an Incredible Hulk movie. Yeah, but he's in the Avengers and he's in Thor. What do yeah. you want? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh you know, it's an MCU. These characters can pop up. Like we, we've got Guardians, or at least Rocket, in Endgame. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll see what happens there. But you know, Guardians three, I imagine, will just be Rocket and Nebula hanging out, <laughs> you're get, right. getting stuff. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but speaking of Iron Man in Avengers and Spider Man, we move on to Spider Man Homecoming, which yeah, the name is has multiple meanings. <laughs> Homecoming, he's back at home at Marvel. Not really, but he is. Um, and, of course, Homecoming being the uh, sort of uh, the dance. Homecoming dance that happens in the third act of the movie. But Spider-Man, to establish that this movie is an MCU, I mean, did they have to have Iron Man in it? Maybe, maybe not. Like, the argument could be made for both. I mean, it's... One should never underestimate how stupid general audiences can be. Right. So putting Iron Man in there and making shots in the trailer that aren't even in the movie yeah. of them flying together. <laughs> yeah. Showing Iron Man's in this. Like, you need that to reach the cheap seats. Yeah. He's like, oh, this is a part of the <laughs> MCU. Mm-hmm. This, this is not. And it's. And they needed that hook to be like, yes, it's the second reboot. In 10 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here's something to, you know, to heal that, that wound. Yep. Toby's not coming back. I know you're sad about that. <laughs> and um, I guess he sort of, he's he's a substitute for the Uncle Ben character. Like, he's the sort of fatherly, familial type that sort of guides uh, Spider-Man on his journey. To become Spider-Man. And again, this is a movie that doesn't have the typical origin tale. You know, you don't see him get bit by Spider-Man, by a spider. Uh, uh, you know, movie begins right where Civil War le- is left off. <laughs> you know, it like, as a matter of fact, before the movie is, is done. It's filmed start- by Peter Parker. Yeah, it starts right at the, I guess, hour mark of Civil War. I think that's where Yeah, he- about. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. And then skips to, what, two months later. Um, so, yeah, it's... it's, And I like the, the sort of flavor of the movie played like a John Hughes film. Like, really. Like, as much as they say Captain America is... Winter Soldier was kind of like a, a, a polit- 70s political thriller. Yes, you can get it, but not really. But this... <laughs> It's mostly marketing talk, but, yeah. but just the vibe. Yeah. It's the vibe. But then when they said this is like a John Hughes movie, it really is. <laughs> it really did feel like a John Hughes mm-hmm. movie. From the music in it, from the the, the, the the classroom interactions, the love story with Peter trying to impress Michelle, uh, the whole deal with the best friend knowing that he's a superhero and said <laughs> saying like, yeah, show up at the party. You know, it's like, the movies of the 80s and 90s, man, it just felt like that. And I really dug it because of that, that, uh, uh, that yeah, feeling. Yeah, especially, the, like, the low stakes. Yeah. Compared, like, like, is someone trying to drop a city, and, like, a comet and blow up the world? No. No. Is someone trying to, you know, steal a, open up a portal so that aliens can come down and blow up the world? No. <laughs> uh... Are they trying to, to you know, stop a plane from crashing on the beach at Coney Island? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the stakes. And especially coming after, not, not like, most violent, but in terms of body count, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 has, like, a really high body count. Right. Just that, that arrow scene. <laughs> One of the best scenes in the MCU, in my opinion. Right. But, like, hundreds of people die in that one scene. Mm-hmm. Uh like the body count in uh, Spider-Man: Homecoming is like one. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> it's that guy who Michael Keaton shoots by accident. Yep, yep. And I wish that scene wasn't in it because I don't like it. It makes him look bad because he doesn't really care after he kills his guy. Right. If I could do a director's cut of that scene, I would just have him like leave after he gets fired. <laughs> like, well, I quit then. Like, you can't no, quit. But I, I like the idea because e- even though you said it makes him look bad because he, he forgot, but the line that he, he says... Oh, I thought this was what was it? it the anti gravity. Yeah, anti gravity. So he didn't mean to kill him, right? But he's not like, no, my guy, yeah. like picking up the ashes. No, I can put you back together. No. <laughs> but, so it's so not like, but, but that's like the one guy who dies. In fact, I thought that um, that uh, there was another guy who got killed in the the ferry because like a car crashes on him. Mm-hmm. But then that turns out to be Scorpion, Scorpion, and then he shows up at the end, you know, with with like wounds. Yeah. Oh, and uh, that guy is, uh, he plays Voss, I think, in Far Cry? Three? Oh, that's him? That's him. Okay, yeah, I can see it now, yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's his face, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and he's also in Better Call Saul. Should watch that movie. Yeah. Watch that show, sorry. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so Spider-Man, um, uh, Vulture uh, being, because I guess you could say Marvel has a villain problem. Like, nah, I wouldn't even call it a problem. They just cater more to their heroes. It, it used to have a villain yeah. problem. But, and in uh, Doctor Strange. But, uh, but I, I dug Vulture, you know. Um, Vulture is so good. Uh, Michael Vulture Keaton, is one of the best characters. Michael Keaton playing his third uh, winged-themed <laughs> character. Um, How many outtakes do you think there are of, uh, I was going to say Tobey Maguire, Tom, Tom Holland, Holland or Robert Downey Jr. calling him Birdman. Perfect. How many outtakes? <laughs> well, actually, I don't think Downey and Keaton were ever in a scene together, though. They oh yeah, that's they true. Didn't remember being been in a scene. Or together. or or even being like, so you had a fight with Birdman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then another cool thing too is all right. So they wanted to, I guess, use Iron Man. Downey Jr. to help sell this movie. One of the fears was that, okay, will this be a Iron Man movie, pretending to be a Spider Man movie? But he's he's not in it a lot, but he's he's in it enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and kind of the opposite of that is, oh, is he just going to be in it for like two seconds? Yes, right. And most of it'll be the suit, right? And like they even tease that when he shows up and then the suit is empty. Yeah. <laughs> But like he's definitely got enough screen time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, I remember even back in Avengers Two, they said that that would be the case. Mm-hmm. They said Avengers Two, oh, it'll just be uh, Robert Downey Jr. in the suit the whole time, and there'll be like one day of shooting of just like the close-ups of him in the helmet. Right. <laughs> um, but like, no, he, they, he has a real role. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then you know it. it solidified the relationship between uh tony and 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 peter which lends into avengers uh infinity war you know that relationship carries over which is why i think a lot of people are affected by that you know tragic ending which we'll get when, to when he didn't feel so good yeah <laughs> um but yeah Loved, love Spider Man. Love the 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 tone of it, the music of it. The you know, directed by John Watts, I think his name is. Yep. Um, I never seen his pre. I never seen Cop, Cop Car. Cop Car. No, me neither. That. But um, makes it did make me want to go check check out his previous work, which I'll probably end up doing. And he's also directing, far, well, finished directing Far From Home, which um, I was just about to ask. Yeah. So that's good to hear. Yeah. So, um, Kevin knows when he has a winner <laughs> with directors that he won't change them. And, you know, that's why James Gunn stuck around. That's why the Russo stuck around. That's why we didn't to some extent stuck around. Even though yeah. We- I mean, he, he, it was a thing of getting directors who not were willing to play nice, but like who understood that, mm-hmm. the, that their role um, in making the film was not in redefining, you know, the the whole MCU, it's like, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They, they, was, they, had to, they had to play nice with the larger. They had, they had room to play around, mm-hmm. and like these movies definitely have their own identity. Uh, some people say that they don't, but they do. Right. Um, even visually, like I remember 
when I finally watched that like video I said, why are the MCU movies so ugly? Uh, oh, I can make them look better by playing with the saturation. So no, you're not making them look better. You're just making them look different, dude. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like they look the way they look just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's bad. Get yeah. over yourself. <laughs> but um, you know, it's 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 more than just a style. And and like we've shown in Phase Three that like they do stretch that style like. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 looks way different from part one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even Homecoming, I feel, looks different from the. Although that might just be because a lot of it is set at night, or at least mm-hmm. that ending. Right. Um, but yeah. Good movie. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. And then now we move on to the one of the most radical departures from the its predecessors ever Thor Ragnarok, directed by Taika Waititi. Which, uh, if you ever watched What We Do in the Shadows, that movie's hilarious. It's a good one. And, oh my god. So, I mean, he, he has co-directing credit on that movie. Um, with the main ca- the guy who plays the... Jermaine Clement. Yeah. So, both of them directed the movie. But, you know, Taika Waititi is also in that film as well. Um, I haven't seen Where the Wild Things Are. Is that the mo- second movie you did? Or that's a different movie. No, something about Wilderbeast. Something about Wilderbeast. Wilder. Oh yeah, with the with the kid from Deadpool. Yeah. So I haven't seen that. Uh, what where the white things are is like, it's Spike Jones. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> um, but uh, he's directing. Uh, um, also, what a weird movie where this wild things are. Who is the audience for that movie? Is it for like fucking forty year old Brooklyn hipsters or little kids? I've never seen that movie, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> what a just, mess. Yeah. What a mess. <laughs> so but the thing with what was cool about Thor Ragnarok, because I remember we mentioned this on our previous podcast when they did the whole announcement uh phase three. Um Kevin said Thor Ragnarok would play the same essentially the same role that uh Winter Soldier played in phase two, which would, you know, change the MCU on its head. I think they. It yeah, no, it doesn't. It did. It, it, it didn't. I, but I think that's because they. Um, they discussed how they wanted to do things different. I think what Chris Evans was tired of how the his Thor films were kind of like the step, <laughs> the step children child of Chris MCU. Evans. What did I say? Evans? Evans? You said you said the best Chris. You meant the second best Chris. Yeah. <laughs> so Hemsworth, he. He was like, you know, we should really do something with Thor that's different. But what he really meant was, I want to do what Guardians of the Galaxy did. <laughs> Let's make yeah, it... I mean, does Hemsworth have a producer credit on that? Or was he just, uh, did they just listen to him? It's interesting. I mean, it's... he might have a producer credit, but even if he does, I think he played Thor long enough for them to kind of give him like a, you know, because you want to make the talent happy. I mean, he's been in like five of these movies so why not right yeah uh, and, and he got the short the short stick on age of ultron he's in it for like 20 minutes yeah <laughs> uh let's see if he has a producer credit oh, uh, fuck you. let's go with but um I mean, producer is only going to be Kevin Feige, but I guess, let's say, executive. Yeah, I mean, yeah. St- uh, how much input do you think Stanley had on these movies, even from, like, phase yeah. one? Like, yeah. none. None. Just like, ah, do whatever you want. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't say here where I'm looking. I'm not even about to do a whole deep dive search. But, but anyway, he did mention that... Um, he wanted to i even remember that time too when he before they even went to start shooting that he wanted to do something different that he loved what james gunn did with guardians that he would love to do a a sort of lighter toned thor ragnarok um thor well thor film which is a far cry from the thor ragnarok that we thought we were gonna get like as a matter of fact when they did the whole uh el capitan thing and they showed thor ragnarok the font it looked different it looked more like dastardly and the music behind it was like oh it's gonna be something serious nope (laughs) so they hired taika and uh you know the story that they came up with and the visual language that they came up with was 
a mixture of something that you would see like in the eighties, you know, the sci-fi movies in the eighties, even the like score. E-Man. Yeah. Um, and I really loved it. I, I, you know, it was really different than, and funny and exciting. Yes. You could say it's, it's copying the, the, the guardians, the formula, but I don't know. It worked for him. Like, I mean, it's, it's copying the guardians formula in that it's a comedy. Yeah. But, Chris Hemsworth is very different mm. from those other actors, from the actors in Guardians. Yeah, because he is so overtly a comic actor. Yeah, and it's something, and it's something that they didn't know when they cast him. Right. Uh, but even in the first Thor, he is funny. Yeah, yeah. He is a funny actor. He's not a comic, but he is a really funny mm-hmm. actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in Thor. Like the first lore, I think that the movie would have been very different mm-hmm. if they had a different actor. Mm-hmm. And in Thor: The Dark World, um, like we said in the last podcast, Thor: The Dark World, just like Thor: Ragnarok, was edited at the last minute to take all the jokes that they had shot and just put them in. Yeah, <laughs> just include, just throw it all in there. Uh, like we said last week, that Thor: Ragnarok originally Taika Waititi was saying that it was going to be like a ninety-minute, hundred-minute movie, mm-hmm. uh, and it wound up being two hours and change. Yeah, because at the last minute they just said, "Let's take every joke that we shot and just throw it in there." Mm-hmm. And like to some people, are there a few too many jokes? Yes. Do I think that the, they could have cut maybe five jokes from that movie? Yeah, or ten jokes from that movie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's. You know, it plays to its strengths, and its strength is how funny Chris Hemsworth is. And he has a different brand of comedy. It's not a writer. uh, I think it's less of a writer writing a joke and giving it to Chris Hemsworth Mm -hmm. as it is, you know, on the day talking with uh, Chris, talking with Taika Waititi and being like one of them or the other going, hey, let's try this. Mm. And that and then that happens like. I can't imagine. Maybe it was. Maybe I'm 100 percent wrong. But uh, you know, Thor throwing the ball at the window and then hitting himself in the face. Yeah, that was hilarious. Was written or storyboarded? I bet that that was that they came up with that on the day. Yeah, they they even, the line according. I mean, I don't know how true this is because you know Hollywood actors tend to lie a bit. But apparently, <laughs> the line where he said when Hulk busts open and he's like, "I know him. He's a friend from work." Was actually. F- uh, from a Make of Wish Foundation child who right, I remember uh, hearing that. Yeah, that he said, "Hey, he should say he's a friend from work." And I thought, "Oh, that's hilarious." I mean, you could definitely the the reason why I kind of believe it is like I could definitely see a kid saying, "Hey, you should say that he's a friend from work." Yeah, yeah. Or uh, it would just be like, "Hey, it's your, he's your friend from work," and be yeah. like, "Eureka!" Yeah. <laughs> um. Now. Another thing that this manages to do well, I always mention my dislike, and dislike is kind of a strong word for whenever a film tries to combine two storylines. Most most times, some sometimes they they manage to take two storylines and make it organically work, but most of the time it it doesn't. I think that was one of the weaknesses with the Dark Knight Rises when they tried to combine Nightfall and No Man's Land. Uh, a lot of movie. It's a lot of movie in there. Yeah, so it was just like, <laughs> you know, uh, and because No Man's Land was such a serious storyline that the sort of wackiness of Nightfall had to give away. <laughs> uh, um, and, then you, and then you've got Talia in there. Right? Uh, and like, 9-11 was an inside job. <laughs> ah. um, and then, you know, like the X-Men The Last Stand was uh, Dark Phoenix and the Cure storyline in one. Um, but this actually has this two storyline, Ragnarok and Planet Hulk. And of course, if Universal didn't have the distribution rights, Planet Hulk would have been his own movie. Like people have been clamoring for Planet Hulk for a long time. It's like, when are we going to get Planet Hulk? But Disney was, j- j- they just weren't going to make that movie because of the whole Universal thing. So they decided, well, well, let's just put Planet Hulk in this movie. And, of course, it... Is with, Thor in yeah. Planet Hulk? No. It, Planet Hulk was his own story, with, with uh, which actually was one of the sort of seeds of, of Civil War, where 
the Illuminati, which includes uh, Tony Stark, uh, Mr. Fantastic, um, T'Challa, Doctor Strange, and Black are Bolt, they like, Professor are they X. Like the legit Illuminati? Uh, they call or do them, they just call themselves they, that? They just call themselves that. Because they shouldn't. <laughs> they should not call themselves that. Uh, but they uh, they figured one of the first steps into making the world better was to uh, exile um, Hulk after he broke Vegas. Exile him to, to another... Well, a planet that... It originally, it was supposed to be a planet that didn't have life on it, but you know they couldn't. It, it something happened with the, the 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 controls on the machines that sent uh, it off course, and they landed on a planet that was with with that uh, had planet. people. Yeah. <laughs> so because of that, uh, what's his name? What the hell, this goes over here. Yeah. Um, because of that, uh, you know, the whole Civil War thing happened. And, well, that was one of the seeds. So people wanted the Planet Hulk movie because they considering that, okay, we're getting Civil War. And Planet Hulk and Civil War was happening at the same time in the comic books. Um, uh, so we, we kind of say, oh, so that, that means they're definitely going to do a Planet Hulk movie. But no, they, they didn't. And they just infused Planet Hulk into to, uh, Ragnarok. But yeah, it works like here. By, but, but like by now, people think that these movies are going to follow the comics. Like, <laughs> they take inspiration for them, but when have they ever followed them? Yeah. Like, they just don't. And, and But again, people just use it as justification for, like, I know exactly what's going to happen because <laughs> in the comics, this. So in the movies, <laughs> obviously this. Right. <laughs> Every single time. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh... But uh, it, it works in um in Thor Ragnarok because it doesn't really combine those storylines. It's like we start out with Ragnarok. Planet Hulk is in the middle. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Enjoyable movie. Uh, uh, great comedy. Enough. Again, it's you mentioned earlier too, where if if uh, Phase Three really had the whole team up aspect of it. Um, you know, Spider Man had Iron Man in it, Captain America had <laughs> the Avengers in it, uh, uh Thor had Hulk in it, and Hulk had a And Doctor Strange. And Doctor Strange. And uh Doctor Strange had a even though it's small, it was really a significant role. Mm-hmm. Um he helped them find Odin. Uh I love that scene. Even though it's a part of it was the post credit scene of, of Doctor Strange, but it's expanded. And I guess another take. They use another take for some of Thor's takes, which uh, I love. Yeah. Like I like that better than like the uh, uh, Ant Man to Civil War. Yeah, kind of just using a clip from it. Right. And I assume you know that the Captain Marvel, Marvel. post credits will be at some point in and war. Damn it, End Game. Yeah. <laughs> end war. I was gonna say End Game, then I corrected myself to End War, and that was wrong. Don't worry. I think. Ah. I don't think Marvel is completely done with war yet. I think down the line we'll get Secret War. <laughs> oh yeah, so they're not done yet. But uh, wait, wait, which one is Secret War? That's not the one with the scrolls, right? No, that's Secret Invasion. Okay, good, because we're never getting that. Actually, we're gonna get it. I think it's gonna be a Captain Marvel sequel, kind of like how Civil War was a Captain America sequel. I think. Well, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a sec. Yeah. But I've got my theory on that. <laughs> that can still happen. But yeah, so. Thor Ragnarok, awesome movie. Now we move on to this movie where I predicted, and I'm going to give myself all the credits, I don't care. Back in 2014, when I believed that they were going to, they're in talks that they were thinking of doing a Black Panther movie. Wasn't official yet, wasn't official until they announced it uh, at the El Capitan in 2015. But there were rumblings that they'll, well, one day they'll work towards a Black Panther movie. I said to myself, and I told my friends and even my girlfriend at the time, it's like, this movie, when they come up with Black Panther, it's going to be huge. It's going to hit at a time where comic book films are, are at its peak 
and people are going to be ready for this. And it's going to, do, it's not like, it, it won't be your typical, even though it's a, if you watch a movie, really, it's a typical comic book movie in some respect, but there's, there's, there's going to be things about it that's going to hit the consciousness in a different way than your typical comic book movie. And it's going to be huge. I bet you, I bet you. And I'm serious, I'm not lying. I'm telling the truth here. <laughs> so, moving close to the Black Panther's release, even though he was introduced in, 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 in uh, Civil War, you didn't get, people didn't feel it yet. People weren't, they still weren't ready for the impact this thing was going to have. And I, in my head, was saying, watch, watch, man. This move, because it's, first of all, it's going to be a major, they're not, it's part of the MCU, which means they're not going to spend, they're not going to make this thing for $20, right? It's going to cost a lot of money, even though not as much as Endgame and, and, and Infinity War or even Thor Ragnarok, but they're going to put a lot of money into this. They they said the budget was two hundred million, but like looking at those CGI effects, I don't know, maybe that was not well spent money. <laughs> they probably spent it on maybe the fabric or some shit like that for the. Maybe they spent design. it on craft services. I mean, Forrest Whitaker and the the other guy, the big guy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, or maybe it was all in pre production to develop develop Wakanda to have it have a unique look to it maybe because they did go all around africa made a, a bunch of trip in africa to do sort of research r&d to where this movie could go so i could see that's probably where the bulk of the money went into but anyway when that first trailer hit you know even though i predicted it it's, it's nice to be right sometimes because sometimes you're like I foresee things happening and it, it doesn't happen, but you can always keep it a secret because you never made it public. <laughs> but the public, how they embraced that first trailer, I saw the beginnings of it. Because it's it like, was like the 70s in that I wanted to be black. Right? <laughs> Everyone wanted to be black when that trailer came out because it was so, such a celebration mm -hmm. of Africa. And it's like, this is a fictional country, but like, you're all welcome. Right? Except for you. <laughs> and then, White person. And then no. a sign, and this is, it's, it's, it's sad that this is a sign that something is effective when naysayers and contrarians and all those people start, to start fighting back. That's when, when they you know. Come out of the, yeah. When you know something is successful is when these guys come out and saying, oh, what is this? Is this uh, it's, it's, it's reverse racism or 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 what else? What was their other thing is like, oh, this is like a. Um, they're like the government that that Wakanda runs is like the, the the government that shouldn't actually be. You're celebrating this sort of totalitarian type. Yeah, even though agoraphobic in the movie Wakanda is supposed to be like america right you know what i mean like they they are a stand-in for like an isolationist american government who realizes they have to go global they have right. to join a global society oh. oh my god it's so good and i, and I love it so much when these freaking you yeah. know white trash oh. Oh, oh. goblins <laughs> come out of the woodwork and being you know the, the same same thing that happened with wonder woman the same thing that wound up happening with uh, captain, captain marvel, marvel yeah <laughs> like and, and it got even worse when it became so big Mm -hmm. Like when it became the highest grossing MCU movie yeah. domestically. Yeah. Even more like Avengers uh, Infinity War couldn't catch it. Right. <laughs> it was like 670 or something like mm -hmm. that. And Black Panther went right past 700. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was more uh, global, but, you know, global, whatever. No, that money is worth less <laughs> than than the domestic dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's nothing that makes me happier than a movie that gets, uh, you know, the, like, anti SJW as if that's even a stance. Uh, social justice? I don't believe in it. I was like, well, then you're kind of overtly uh, saying that you're a piece of shit. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't believe in justice. <sighs> like, like, oh, is that what Superman said in Justice League? I'm not a fan of justice. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
ah, that one good scene in Justice League. <laughs> but that's a different, that's a yeah. different thing. I was, uh, and, and then it's like, oh, well, of course, Disney just bought out all of the uh, whatever. Right. Uh, I every time, ah, every time Screen Rant gets accused of being bought out by Disney, I'm like, oh yeah, I wish, because <laughs> then I have more money and a 4K TV, right? <laughs> But also, I would never take that. But yeah. um, because, and no one would. And if they did, it would be like a gigantic story. But every time anything comes out, people just say, "Oh well, I heard that they're bought out." Or, and it's like, "Oh yeah. well, you heard it from like what? A bug up your own ass?" That's what I'm saying. I hate. There's like so many of these YouTube videos dedicated. Oh, this person is a Disney shill, and that's a Disney shill, and this women women this or captain women or it was like oh my god dude just relax yeah the, like, i stay away from all of that it's just, like it's i, so I try to once i accidentally watched like 15 minutes of a midnight edge video on star trek discovery right uh and they're just like this anti-star trek discovery channel that just like hates everything about yeah. it and they're like oh it's being canceled already and like it hadn't even started yet <laughs> uh and 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 I was just like, oh wait, I get it. This is bullshit. <laughs> and is it not interested? Yeah. Why? Because I'm not interested in this stupid ass channel. <laughs> yeah, but, it's just so stupid. And but but Black Panther was able to cut through all that noise. You know, a lot of people, my people, were so proud of this thing. You know, came in their in their dashikis in the theaters. This thing was. Huge man, like Wakanda became a a new word in the uh, in vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't see Black Panther for like a couple of months. It took me a while for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you know, I remember it's because I was waiting for my Movie Pass subscription uh, for my card to come in, right. and I did, I did get it, and it was the first movie that I saw. But like, it took a while for the card to actually come. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, nope, I'm gonna save my money because I just spent a hundred dollars on this Movie Pass thing. Uh, and when I did finally see it, uh, and it was like a, just a couple of weeks before, uh, Avengers. yeah, before Avengers came out mm-hmm. and the theater was, was just like the most diverse theater I'd ever seen. I've never seen more like senior citizen black people in a movie theater mm-hmm. before. I was like, I've never seen this many old black people watching a movie mm-hmm. that I'm watching. Um, and I'm like, that's that power that that movie had. It like got people who don't give a shit about this kind of movie to be like, yeah, this the movie that you know. If more movies were like this, I would see more of them. And and you know the question that what I posed to you earlier in terms of like, was fi- any film in a phase three a good film to watch, even if you hadn't seen any previous movies? I would say this one comes the closest to being like a standalone movie. Yeah, I mean, because like it, it's got like the brief, brief flashback to uh Civil to War. Civil War, yeah. the bomb. Like, even if you don't know anything about what happened in Civil War, you'd be yeah. like, well, his dad was killed in a terrorist attack, and yeah. so now he's the king, and he's not ready to be king yet. Boom, let's go. Yeah. yeah. So and it and I mean, by it had to be by design, considering that they want everyone to watch this movie. Mm-hmm. This is an important movie. It had to be made to, to the point where, other than like the post credit scene, or maybe the scene in the casino where where um, Freeman's character, what's his name, mentions Everett Ross. Yeah, Everett Ross mentions uh, Sokovia. I don't even think he name dropped the Avengers. I think he just called. Uh, he didn't name drop Avengers or Ultron, did he? I don't but, think so. But he did mention Sokovia City, uh, the Soko- uh, the incident in Sokovia. But yeah, other but than, like even that, like you yeah. could just go. Well, you know, even if you don't know about it, you go. Well, he's a superhero. There must be other superhero stuff going right. around. Yeah. So like. Whatever, or it just goes right over your head, and then right. you're you're, you're in it the next second. Yeah, basically, like there there was little to no mention of a bigger universe uh, in 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 the entire runtime of the movie, except for the fact that Winter Soldier shows up the at the end. Um, so yeah, that that is white. Wolf. Yeah, white wolf. Right? So they that's had, what that's what they call me in bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh no i have short hair now damn it 
Oh, I used to have my Bucky hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that movie just really touched uh, the 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 world on another wait, level. Wait, wait, wait. I was Bucky with the good hair. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, really. I love the fact that the movie movie was like, I, to me, if I was to say what this movie is like, it's Batman meets Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> but better than that sound. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I love, yeah, I love it. Because it had a lot of Lion King isms in it, right? Death of the father, oh, yeah. you know, he does communicate with the father in, in the astral plane. Um, Remember who you are. A, a family member is, is challenging him for the throne, you know, you know, in the, in the movies, the cousin in Lion King is the uncle. Uh, what else? Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of Lion King esque stuff happens in this movie. Even the, I mean, the soundtrack Ryan, is almost as like Ryan Coogler deserves all. You know, we talk about the MCU being so producer driven. How it's like it's Kevin Feige's mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think in this case, and it's probably happened in other cases. The Ru I think Roosters uh, do develop uh, deserve yeah. some of that I, credit as well. I, too. I think I think Kevin Feige knows trusts the Russos enough to go. All right, I'll leave you to it. Uh, yeah. Here's two hundred million dollars. Uh, come back with a movie. Yeah, uh, I'm sure he step. You know, yeah. that plays. A, 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 I'm simplifying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think with with the Avengers, the first Avengers, he basically went to Joss Whedon and said, "You know what to do." Mm -hmm. uh, I think that with Black Panther, he was just like, I don't really have that much to add to this. <laughs> so uh, Ryan Coogler, uh, I will, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be over here doing Thor or whatever. And I think uh, the because he, like again, Kevin has his team, um, team of producers as well. Nate Moore being one of them, who's African American. Uh, Trini, Trini Tran, I think she's Asian. Um, so. Nate Moore has been asking for so when are we doing Black Panther? <laughs> and he's like soon, soon, soon. While they were doing, I think. Uh, is he one of his producers? Yeah, Nate Moore is, is one of the uh, um, pr production team. Um, okay. With Kevin is ahead of um, like all is he of black. Yes, Nate Moore is an African American. So he's like, when are we doing? He's always every movie they're doing is like, okay, when are we doing Black Panther? Uh, Age of Ultron came. It's like, oh, we we're mentioning Wakanda. Black Panther isn't it? No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Um, Civil War's come in, Black Panther's in, yeah, he's in it, oh, awesome, so no, when are we getting his own movie? Oh, soon, soon, soon. So, when it came time, so when it came time to doing, uh, uh, Black Panther, I think that's one of the movies Kevin took a step back on. Even though he's produced, still a sole producer on it, I think that was only in name. Nate Moore took the reins on that one. Uh, um, and during press, uh, Nate Morris did a lot of press and he was mentioned a lot. That's because I think he was really the one that kind of was spearheading, uh, getting the team together for Black Panther, getting Ryan Coogler, getting Ruth, Ruth Carter, getting, uh, um, uh, the, the cinematography, I forgot her name. Um, but yeah, a lot of the Nate Moore was basically pushed almost to the producer head for this, for this film. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was definitely a different brand for the MCU, a different taste. And it, if, if the Avengers put a stamp on the MCU, Black Panther put a world stamp on the MCU. And in some ways it feels like the most, uh, science fiction of these movies mm -hmm. because, yeah. It, it has this, you know, this fantasy world of Wakanda, mm -hmm. but it's also telling just a very real story about black issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, like, I love that part of the movie is set in California. Right. Uh, and it's like that's a connective tissue that even if you're not black, mm -hmm. you can still just appreciate what it's trying to say about, you know, about about different cultures and the right to exist mm -hmm. that is so often denied 
in big ways and small ways, like the fact that this is the first time we've got a, a black lead. Yep. Who's not like the best friend? Yeah. It's so great. It's so funny to see um, Martin Freeman as the white best friend, right? <laughs> when like every single hero's got the black best friend. Yeah. You got your Rhodes. You got your Falcon. Who is the best Avenger? And you've got your even in afterwards, um, Maria, Maria Hill? from Captain Marvel. Oh, uh, Maria Rambo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. Like, they all fit the black best friend. Although, at least Maria Rambo is a lot more, like, there's more nuance to that. And, like, they they do have their own personalities and develop differently as the movies go on. Mm -hmm. Mostly Falcon. Falcon's the best. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so weird that it took until 2017 for someone to go, what if the black guy isn't the sidekick? Yeah. Yeah, like like we think we're so progressive. Mm -hmm. We think we're so great. Even you know my people, the coastal elitists. We think there's we think we're so great, but it took until 2017 to do that. Mm -hmm. Like we're not that great if if this is how far we are in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know it it's it's a great movie. It's one of the. It, if not in my top five, it's definitely in my top six. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it's not in my top five, but I give it an honorary. It's like I would have my top five MCU, but I give Black Panther this whole onto itself position of uh, what it honorary Oscar. Yeah. As what it represented for just a community on a whole, the kind of movie that sa says okay you know just because you're a minority doesn't mean you're not going to sell tickets you know j you know you can't give as much detail to this kind of film based on the material it is it it's based on uh because oh you think it's not going to sell in diff this country or that country or whatever right um so yeah i i just it it represents so much uh that even if it's not in my top 5 i it's it's in a, in a league of its own. Um, and then it also makes me both love <laughs> and envy Ryan Coogler because he's so young. He's like, what, 32 or four or something like that. And he's directing this huge film. Um, you know, I'm, I'm After Creed. yeah. Right. Like uh, I saw Fruitville station. Um, I even watched his couple of his student films. Um, that you know i was like damn man like if i had continued on that trajectory i could have been where he's at right because i did a couple of student films too so i just looked at his student films and was like they're pretty good i love them and then he did fruitville station and then creed which is like you thought would never work because it's like how are you gonna, 10 out of 10 how are you gonna do a spinoff of rocky which by the time it got to like rocky 5 was kind of even though rock rocky balboa was pretty good i love that movie yeah. Um, did, did I tell you my story about um, about Creed? No, no. Um, I knew about that movie before anyone else did. Really? But I didn't believe it. Uh, my friend Claire, who worked for, for Men's Fitness, he came in uh, after Fruitvale Station, like a little, like a while after. But he was part of like Men's Fitness, like Game Changers or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and she did an interview with him could barely understand him through his like extremely thick Oakland accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was she she was like I was so embarrassed cuz I kept on having to be like what? Yeah. <laughs> and, and she's like uh you know, a middle-aged white lady and she was like, "Oh my god, this I sound so awful because I can't understand what he's saying." Yeah. Uh but he said that he was that he his next movie was going to be Rocky, mm -hmm. was going to be Creed. Uh and she was like, "Oh, really? What is that going to be?" And he's like, and he gave her like the basic outline of like the setup of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then she showed me, and I was like, "That would be amazing," but like, there's no way. <laughs> and then like, like that's a movie that I would love to see more than I'd love to see anything in the world. Mm -hmm. But like, I just you know, all the behind the scenes stuff that it would take to get something like that going. Right. And then like, then like a couple of months later, they're like, "He signed the deal," and I was like, "Okay, yeah, he signed the deal," but mm -hmm. like. You know when is it? And then a few months later, we've got a trailer. And I'm like, okay, all right, let's do it. And then that movie wound up being 
Oh, yeah, China was, China. I was like, yeah. holy shit. But if you speaking of this his accent, like every time I hear him talk too, it's like I can understand him, but I'm like, how does he's in he's in corporate America here? It's like how like, does he talk? I can understand him, but I have to really focus. Yeah, I have right? to like lean forward and be like, uh huh. I wonder okay. how. I wonder how he talks to Kevin and and some <laughs> of the higher ups, like because he does sometimes he doesn't. So, like sometimes he tries, but sometimes he doesn't give a shit. It's like he's, you know, what I'm saying, you know, you know, you know, try to there, you know, what I'm saying. It's like, <laughs> you know how he sounds like. This is how he every time he talks, he sounds because and it's just funny because he used to be a football player. He sounds like anytime you're doing an interview with uh, like a, a post game uh, interview with one of the players on a on the team. And how they're talking, you know, passing the ball, and it will be, you know, maybe a trick. You know, a team was <laughs> straight. <laughs> he sounds just like that. He's giving a post game interview every time he talks. I was like, yo, this guy, man. I mean, and, but it doesn't matter if we can understand him as long as he can articulate that in a way that shows up on film. Yeah, that's what I was saying. And that's all. That's all that matters. Yeah. So th- and that's what makes me even doubly happy for him is that he doesn't conform to what you think he should be as a filmmaker directing big budget movies, right? You know, like he, Antoine Fuqua when he's talking, you can you can see him ag- existing in corporate America. Uh, Spike Lee, as much as he's woke. Hey, Antoine was my my very first uh, interview. Oh, nice! My first telephone interview. Uh, well, it was the second because at first I did the one of the actors from the movie, but then he called me like right after. Oh, nice. So it was the same day. So mm-hmm. I still consider him the first. Right. Uh, so I lost it to Antoine Fuqua. <laughs> um, and then even John Singleton, hopefully, he gets better after the stroke. Uh, um, you know, he he does. He makes it. He, pl- he speaks plainly enough for you to understand for to, to exist within corporate America. But Ryan, oh, are any of the, are any of them from Oakland though? Well, I know Singleton is from California. I don't remember where. Maybe he's from Compton. I think because Oakland is like very specific. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, like isn't it in the comics? It's, it was supposed to be Harlem. Yeah, right. Yeah, but then he was like, "Let's make it Oakland." Yeah, because he's. And then Kevin from Feige there. was like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> what?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, yeah so Black Panther thumbs up made an impact but then now we move on to the beginning of the end the the event that broke us <laughs> it broke us Avengers Infinity War previously, previously called Avengers Infinity War Part 1, but was retitled to Infinity War because they said Endgame would be its own movie with a different tone. Uh, and this would have its own beginning, middle, and end, and would be a Thanos movie. And I believe, when I watch it, it's true. A lot of people still say it's not its own movie. I disagree. I f- it had its beginning, middle, and end. Uh, it's just the bad bad guy won. It's, it's it was a Thanos movie. It was a Thanos arc. He set out to do something, and the Avengers were his antagonists. <laughs> yeah, just because a movie has a cliffhanger ending doesn't mean it's not its own movie. Right. You know, mm-hmm. like a cliffhanger doesn't mean it's a two part story. A cliffhanger just means that the ending is in such a way that. You don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah, I mean, like going back to Civil War, that is a cliffhanger ending. Like, oh my God, yeah. the Avengers broke up. What's going to happen next, <laughs> right? He said, fuck your daddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, oh, that shield. My dad made that shield. You oh, don't deserve your dad. it. <laughs> you just dropped it. Ping. <laughs> I feel like that's this show's catchphrase is fuck your daddy. <laughs> I feel like I've said that like every episode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um,. But yeah, uh, this movie was huge. Uh, it, it, first of all, it, I mean, it, it never really dealt with the fallout of uh, Civil War directly in terms of, like, we never got to see uh, Cap and Iron Man make up. 
you know, they were separate for the entire movie. Um, most of the heroes were separate for the entire movie, which was, the, I guess, the point of Civil War was to divide our heroes. Um, and that was one of the contributing fact, uh, factors in them losing because they weren't a team. Um, you know, uh, that was one. And the other was that Thanos was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. The Avengers weren't. At least not at first until it was too late. You know, with the whole let's kill Vision so that he doesn't get his hands on the time uh, the the Mind Stone. They we win. don't trade lives. Yeah, right. But Captain, you did it in uh, the first Avengers. Don't mind that movie, goddammit. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's a decision that they have to make themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it was different because he wasn't surrounded by his friends. Right. <laughs> Uh, so there was no one, to, no one to stop him. But uh, music movie was epic, man. Um, it, we did a whole two hour review on that film back in the day, so like, there's not much more we could add to that. But just to say, just wow, <laughs> you know, when the movie ended with the snap, the I mean, I mean, it's officially called the decimation in the movies, but we all call it the snapping. <laughs> uh, um, where we have. You know, because there were a lot of people were predicting, oh, this would be the end of Tony Stark or this is the end of Captain America. One of the major Avengers are going to die in this movie. They didn't think that every other Avenger but the main Avengers are going to die in this mm -hmm. movie. Exactly. You know, whatever you think is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Like, even with, with Endgame, whatever you think is going to happen. Right. Probably not going to happen. <laughs> you know? Cause, like they they even teased it like they they you know Thanos stabs the shit out of Iron Man right in their fight all that for a drop of blood yeah uh, I remember every time because I seen the movie like maybe four times times in the theater and every time that scene happens the crowd goes oh my god because it's like it's Tony you're gonna kill Tony yeah. it's good it's good dying acting yeah good oh oh no I am stabbed <laughs> oh. um and then. Uh, and then part and, of the... Go ahead. Well, well, and then like you said, you know, the way they, they, they yeah. kill literally everyone else. Like, they kill the next generation of Avengers that have been set set up to be the next generation. Right. They're the ones who die. <laughs> they wiped out potentially $3 billion. <laughs> in in box of, office revenue. Yeah, right. And that's just with Black Panther. Right? It's like, you wait, they killed, uh, they killed the Guardians? They killed Black Panther? T'Challa? What? Not even Okoye, but Black Panther himself. I know. Like they, they make the way they make you think Tony's gonna die. That they have fun. It's almost like they have fun with it. Yeah. They make you think that that Okoye is gonna die, and you're like, oh well, you know, you know, sorry, we hardly knew you, but you know, you're not, you're not the money. Yeah. Um, and then and then Black Panther dies, and he doesn't even know it. Right. He doesn't even realize he's dead until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the they play with the whole um captain america wars mm -hmm. of who's going to be a captain america in a hypothetical future in which steve rogers is not ca captain america which everyone just assumes is going to happen when like it's probably not going to happen he's going to be capped for a while <laughs> um like but oh but his contract no that's just that's just going out in public and saying that stuff so that they give you more money like you don't think that's just part of the game you don't think he's dying at, at the end of nah. the game <laughs> nah They'll think he's dead, and then he'll come up with, on the bridge with one of the Shankara stones and being like, you thought I was dead? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, the, the, uh, Bucky's the first one to go. Mm -hmm. And, like, in my head, I was like, oh, no, Bucky. But then in the back of my head, I was like, well, I guess this means Falcon's going to be Cap, huh? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he dies, too. And I'm like, like oh. oh, no! <laughs> like, they made it. They mathematically designed it so that Someone you love mm -hmm. is gonna die, and of course the one that got everybody's uh, more emotional <laughs> than all the heroes, <laughs> Mr. Stark. I don't feel so good. <laughs> You're gonna be fine, kid. You're gonna be fine. That was my Robert Downey Jr. impression. It was very bad. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm sorry. It's the, just broke people, man. It's Ooh. like Ooh, too much. Um, and that movie just like when the end, <laughs> it ended. Now. Marvel did something really crazy that I think, to your point, was messing with them, right? 
right around the point where you'd, you'd usually see a mid credit scene, they left that screen blank a, a few seconds longer than it should be. Yep. <laughs> like, after they did the whole dusting of the Infinity War uh, logo, left it blank, no music, everybody's sitting there, okay, post credit scene. And then the credits start rolling. Whoa! <laughs> I almost wish that they didn't have... Like, I know they, they needed that Captain Marvel tease. Mm-hmm. But part of me wishes that they had just, I don't know, incorporated that, that into the for, snap sequence. For a long time, they were discussing whether they were going to have a post credit scene or not uh, for that movie. Um, they almost didn't go for one, but they decided to go for one. Um, I, I think if it were up to me, I would cut that. But I would have put it in like uh, I would have put it in the montage of everyone getting killed. Here's here's the thing though. I I would see an argument to be made why they wouldn't want to do that because that that was one of the earlier things they sh- uh sort of later things they shot right around the time they were beginning or wrapping up production on Endgame. They brought in um, uh, Sam and and, and uh, uh, Kobe. Kobe to to shoot that scene. The, the argument I could see them having why they didn't want to put it in the within the dusting of the others is that every other person you saw dusted you saw at some point in the me- throughout the film. Mm. This would have felt too much of like, oh, now, you know, meanwhile over here is like it breaks the whole narrative structure of the film to just all of a sudden you cut to these new people. Well, even though we know them, to, you know, but it just feels like, oh, where have where have they been for the last two and and hours and change? It's like all of a sudden, these new characters, you know. So it feels, I guess it it feels more appropriate after the credits because it's like, yeah. okay, it's like setting up something. Versus... I mean, and you gotta you gotta throw them, you gotta throw the kids a bone. Yeah, <laughs> like they just saw Spider Man die and they got no mid credits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they gotta give him something. Yeah, um, but, but yeah. like, it, it, it's Thanos will return. That's the that's it, right? That's the line. Oh, that's the chills. <laughs> um, but yeah, great movie made two what two point zero one or two something billion. Basically, it's a, a two billion bit, dollar hit. Two, yeah, so it's there's nothing more we can actually say about this movie that we haven't said about it how the Russos did their thing, all they basically managed to take how many, 46 heroes, <laughs> characters, and sort of like give everyone their own due. You know, Thor had his arc. Uh, Anthony had his arc. Uh, Thanos had his arc. You know, the Guardians of the Galaxy played an important role in it. And Oh man, Captain America and Rocket Raccoon are gonna fuck up Thanos' shit. Yeah, right. So you know, going forward in Endgame, I think they have a lot, a much easier job because the, the they did they dusted half the cast, so yeah. the easier easier job. And then now we go to our palate cleanser, which is Ant Man and the Wasp. Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, you know, smaller movie. Um, again, pun intended. <laughs> Um, and again, again, like Spider Man, a body count of maybe zero, maybe one. Right. There's that one person that ghost punches and like electrocutes or whatever mm. with their power, and you're like, "Ugh, that guy might be dead. He's he might be dead. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's dead." I like to I like to to head cannon that he's not dead. He's just very badly burned. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, what I would say about this film in terms of I w- I don't want to say weakness, but like. Something that the other Marvel films have that Diz doesn't have, or maybe it could be a strength, is like, okay, you think Ghost is a villain, but she's not. And then the villain, other villain, is almost like separate from the entire story. Like, he, he has his own agenda. But it right, because he's, he's just in it for the money. He's just yeah, a mercenary. Right? So it almost feels uh, not off the, the plot itself. You know, like, the main plot is this woman who wants to heal herself by getting the quantum device or whatever, using quantum energy to heal herself. Uh, but then you have this other guy and, and, you know, so there's never a clear cut. Oh, this is a bad guy, which is a good or a bad thing, depending on what your take is on what's your enjoyment factor of a film. 
Yeah, I think it's a good thing for this movie in particular because more than other MCU movies, you know, they're, they're MCU movies that are more serious and less serious, but a few of them are, are comedies. Mm-hmm. Like Guardians of the Galaxy is a comedy. Right. Thor Ragnarok is a comedy. And Ant-Man is a comedy. Mm-hmm. But I think Ant-Man, the Ant-Man movies are slightly more traditional in their status as comedy movies. Right. And the other one's the first one because it's co-written by Adam McKay. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one, uh, did Paul Rudd co-write this one? I want to say know. yes. I want to say but, yes. Uh, yeah. But it's a little bit more general oh, screwball. Oh, he did. He did. He did. Re- How I know he did is because he, when he did an interview, they asked him uh, if he knew about anything that was going to happen in Infinity War and Endgame. He said, oh, he knew because he was writing the scene where he gets stuck in the quantum realm. Like, uh-huh. he was part of the writing team that led to that event happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and when a movie is more comedy-driven, it doesn't need to have the same, you know, villain driving the action. Right, right. It can, you know, it, weird. And wh- I think why a lot of the MCU movies are more comedic in tone mm-hmm. is because that allows the hero to drive the action. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's more pronounced the funnier the movie is. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, going back to Thor Ragnarok, a lot of the w- w- Planet Hulk stuff is much more hero driven. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all in the middle of the movie. Yeah. Then when you get to the end, that's when it's much more Hela driven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's slightly less money mm-hmm. uh, and more serious in tone. As. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Very funny, driven by humor. Um, and Lawrence Fishburne, and, like, Lawrence Fishburne's son, who looks like a CGI Lawrence Fishburne. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that facial capture, that de-aging. No, that, that's, that's not de-aging. That's Lawrence Fishburne's son. <laughs> so, is like, it, is like it... no, that actually, I'm not even making a joke right now. That is Lawrence Fishburne's son, who just looks exactly like Lawrence Fishburne. Was that Lawrence Fishburne's yes. son? Yes. You sure? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. I'm not. I'm not doing a bit. Wow. He You're just, lying. Like he. I'm not doing a bit. You yeah. think I'm doing a bit because I do so many bits, but I am not doing a bit. That was his son. That is his son. Holy shit! Playing young uh, Goliath, whatever the character's yeah, yeah, name yeah. is. Bill Foster. Um, Bill Foster. So what? What did you think of? Uh, uh, Pfeiffer's de aging in it. I love her. She's my girlfriend. <laughs> she doesn't even need to be de aged. She's still gorgeous. Right. Um. But yeah, I mean the fair faucet haircut. Yeah. Um. I love it. Yeah. I, I had that one. I haven't seen since I saw it in theaters. Mm-hmm. And I'm not. There's no way I'm going to be able to rewatch everything. Uh. Before Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Yeah. But. But I think that that i'll watch that one that, that one's on netflix right um yes ant-man and black Pan- so guardians is on there black panther is on there avengers is on there and uh, uh ant-man and the wasp yeah and i have all of phase one and two and a couple of phase threes on blu-ray so i'll watch I'll watch a handful yeah i did a, i did a couple of rewatches not the entire because i did the whole rewatch for Infinity War, for this time I selected a few movies. I did, uh, uh, I did the first Avenger. I did Avengers. I did Winter Soldier. Um, I did Guardians, Ultron, Civil War. I think that was the last thing I watched. I'm gonna watch uh, Infinity War between now and tomorrow. <laughs> I, I might do if I. If I do the next time I do like a full rewatch, oh god, it'll take days. <laughs> um, I, it'll be when when End War, damn it, End, End Game, Game. <laughs> comes out on Blu-ray, right? Because I do have a bunch of Phase Three Blu-rays that I haven't gotten yet because of the because uh, they're on Netflix, so it's maybe not by the Blu-rays. Uh-huh. Can, uh, yeah. Can I tell you something? Well, this is this is a, another tangent. Because there was something I wanted to remember um, when we were talking about Michelle Pfeiffer that had something to do with the 
Marvel Universe before. Okay, have you ever seen the movie she did, What Lies Beneath? Yeah. Her and Harrison Ford. Do you know who wrote that movie? Paul Rudd. Clark Gregg. What? Yes. <laughs> no. Clark Gregg wrote that movie. I didn't know that. That's crazy. And it's not ah. e- it's not even like uh, Clark Gregg with a bunch of other writers and maybe he just contributed screenplay by Clark Gregg. <laughs> well, speaking of Clark Gregg, the next and final movie before yep. Endgame. Captain Marvel. Yeah. So here's the thing. Before I get into detail, I would say Captain Marvel to me. I love the movie. Let's get that out of there. I love the movie. But it's just a good MCU film. Now, a good MCU film, by any standards of film, is better than most out there, right? Especially, yeah, I mean, in terms of blockbusters, you know, like MCU is... Right. Kind of ha- kind of has a monopoly. Disney, definitely. Mm-hmm. But the MCU in particular has a little bit too much of an uncomfortable monopoly on blockbusters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and, like, you know, Captain Marvel, really good, does does a lot of great th- kind of like you know like black panther it's mm-hmm. it's reductive but also not inaccurate to say that you know two women mm-hmm. captain marvel does does what uh, black panther did for the black community yeah uh you know yeah it, it diminished a little tiny bit because of uh wonder woman a couple years ago mm. yeah yeah a little <laughs> but not enough you know and the fact that, you know, Marvel is just on a whole other level from any other shared universe. You know, when they do it, we listen more than when other people do it. Right, right. Even when it's a character as beloved as Wonder Woman. Mm. Like, could you imagine a world, any world, where Wonder Woman is not as popular as Captain Marvel? Right, like, Wonder Woman made, what, seven or eight hundred million it was like seven, seven something, mm-hmm. but domestic was four hundred. It right. was like four hundred eight, I think. Yeah. Uh, and Captain Marvel is like right there. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it just, it's just a strength of the Marvel studio, and maybe it's because it served as an appetizer for Endgame too, where everybody's like, well, let's see who is this person that's supposed to be the game changer for Endgame. Yeah, um, I think that's that's definitely a factor. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as I think that it was definitely a factor for um, for uh, Black Panther, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was a month earlier com- by comparison, but still, you know, there was a lot of hype. Yeah, yeah, going into it. Um, but you know, it's impossible to understate how important it is when you take these audience. You know. It's a difference between broadening your audience as wide as possible mm-hmm. and broadening it with intelligence. Yeah, yeah. It's like if you make a stupid Transformers movie, everyone's going to see it because <laughs> people want to see Transformers. Mm-hmm. But like stupid people want to see Transformers also. Right. I'm not sure why they like dumb stuff, <laughs> but like those are dumb movies for dumb people. <laughs> and I love them. Uh, oh, okay, well, I like three and four. Um but we've that's a whole other discussion. I like one to three, I, but yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen Bumblebee yet, but was... uh, I'll I'll catch it on on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you take this audience, when, when you say we're not going to make our movie dumb, mm-hmm. uh, if you want to come and see it, you can come see it, but we're going to appeal to people who don't normally come, don't normally see this kind of movie because they think it's beneath them. Mm-hmm. Or because, like, they don't care. Because you could ask a million people, you know, like, do you care about Captain America? And people who are passionate about it will go, like, yeah. But a lot of people will be like, who cares? Right. That it's a comic book and comic books are dumb. But, um, like, like that's not me saying that comic mm-hmm. books are dumb. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but you could go, well, what if it's – she's like Captain America, but, like, you know, she's a girl in the 90s. Mm then there's a, an audience there that's not necessarily interested who goes, huh, maybe I'll check it out. Mm-hmm. It's like if you go, you know, do you want to see Batman? 
uh, no, I don't want to see Batman, mm-hmm. comic books, whatever. Well, what if like Batman was like a symbol of African pride? Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, maybe, uh, maybe there's something there, mm-hmm. and it does not diminish at all from what the movie is trying to say mm-hmm. as a superhero movie. It's not like stuff is tacked on to appeal to people. Right. It's like it, it just meshes that DNA of both of those sides together. Mm. And says that this movie is the next comic book movie from Marvel Studios, a studio that makes great comic book movies 21 times in a row. Mm -hmm. And also, in addition to that, we're telling a story about being a woman or about being Mm African-American or in the, you know, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for them to give Michael Pena his own superhero movie. Cause like (laughs) the way that, you, you know, it's one of those things where every superhero movie appeals to me because I'm white. <laughs> and they're, uh, oh, I could see myself in Robert Downey Jr. because we have the same amount of pigment in our skin. Mm-hmm. The same with Chris Evans and Chris Hemsworth and Chris Pine. And he's not even in one of those. And Chris Pratt and all the Chris's and, every, you know, Doctor Strange and all of them. D- don't pretty worry. Much. Chris Pine is, is going to join the, M- the MCU one of these days. They'll get the, that, Chris. You're not going to escape he's for a, too long. <laughs> he's the last Chris. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when they do a Latino superhero, I'm going to feel the way, and not to put words in your mouth, but the way you felt with Black Panther. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because that, because, you know, I'm half, I'm mm-hmm. half. <laughs> uh, and and that, half, th- that half of me is pretty underserved in mm-hmm. terms of Hollywood blockbusters. Mm-hmm. We've got Michael Pena and uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. It, Michael, uh, ben, Benedict Cumberbatch is Hispanic? No, but he's con for some reason. Oh, ha! Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, did they did they even get his audition tape for Black Panther? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I would love to see. He would never do it, but I'd love for him to do that on like Jimmy Kimmel or something. Benedict Cumberbatch auditioning for every ethnic role. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to pick on Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, That's not it's, he'll be fine. He, he's great. He's he'll great. be fine. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the only thing, that, just one last thing on Benedict Cumberbatch. The only thing that pissed me off more than casting a white guy as Khan mm-hmm. was how good he was in yeah. that role. So, like, mm-hmm. like he should have been, he should have been just John Harrison. Why, why couldn't he just been John Harrison? Why he has to be Khan? Or, yeah, basically John Harrison. Since this is an alternate timeline the kelvin timeline what they should have did was instead of it being khan that was freed from the genesis uh, program or something whatever because remember it was oh, a no. bunch of th- well, well genesis was star trek too uh they were he was a prisoner on the botany bay he was basically frozen and put out to space well wasn't it that a bunch of super soldier type guys were yeah, it, it was him and all of his soldiers yeah so it should have been like since it's a different timeline something happened where it was one of his soldiers that were freed instead of him. Well, that, that is a popular fan theory. Right. That they basically, they freed a white guy and he's like, I am Khan. But it's not the real Khan. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that's like a fan theory. But I think there's a comic book where like they alter him with plastic surgery uh, or whatever. But, but again, you know how I feel about tie-in comics. Yeah. They are fun, but they're not canon because they're not in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we talked about that with um, Kevin Feige saying, "Of course, that was Spider Man in Iron Man 2. <laughs> oh, fuck you, buddy! No, it wasn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and, until unless there's a scene in End Game, where that's Spider-Man what I'm thinking is too. Like, it's like I met you in Iron Man 2, and yeah. it was so great, and you saved me from a robot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then 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 I'll be like, okay, now it was canon. Yeah, now it's canon. Now it has always been that, but until that happens, yeah. nope. All right. So one of the things I liked about uh, Captain Marvel as well is when they mentioned it that they were kind of going for that T two vibe. I did get a T two vibe as well, just in the aesthetic, of how it was shot. You know, it, it being in the nineties, of course, and like of course the scene where she takes the motorcycle and a jacket you know very much t2-esque um uh jude law he played spoiler for people who haven't seen the movie but you know i like his villainous turn even though he wasn't really i guess you could 
say later on, depending on how they go with the sequel, that he could remain either a bad guy or a good guy, uh, uh, depending. Because he, uh, even though he had his ulterior motive for taking Carol, uh, you know, you can't serve with her that long without having feelings developed. I'm sure he had some caring for her. Uh, but yeah, lovely movie. I loved it. Uh, it wasn't yeah, the best. There's a lot of... There's a lot of room there for uh-huh. them to, to explore his character more. Um, you know, I remember when they announced the cast, mm-hmm. people were like, oh, this is going to secretly be a Guardians of the Galaxy prequel. Right. And it almost is, but it, but it's not. Like, we don't learn enough about Juman Hansu mm-hmm. to, to the point where I don't even remember his name still. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Korath, the Pursuer, I think. Korath. Korath. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, if you didn't immediately recognize him, you wouldn't even know he's the same character. Right. Um, and even Ronin showed up for, like, two seconds. <laughs> yeah, even Ronin he showed up at the end. So it's kind of like uh, maybe they're saving that mm-hmm. for Se- a sequel. But then again, like, would I want a Captain Marvel 2 to be set before, you Yeah, know, I don't want that. Hopefully they we- don't do that. Because that's what they're doing with Wonder Woman, isn't it? Well, I mean... Right. Yeah, Wonder Woman is... Yeah. It's set in 84, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I don't know if... But that would be too much of Disney trying to copy Wonder Woman. It would be too... But they're, they're a little bit in a pickle because if they'll either copy Wonder Woman or they'll copy Winter Soldier. Right. Set afterwards. Uh-huh. Although, obviously, there'll be significantly less of a culture shock going 30 years rather than 70. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, um... You know, I, I think that depending on how Endgame goes, there will be, you know, the future is wide open to tell this story. Maybe, you know, it's, it has flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Jiman Hansu survived. His finger on the throat means death <laughs> moment. Right. Uh, he'll be the villain. You know, Jude Law has got to be back because he survived. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's got to be back. I think even Annette Benning will be back. Uh, as well, but not as Captain, not as Marvel, but as the World Mine. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, because that's like that's the setup. Is yeah. like they're setting up. You no, know, oh, I'm gonna take down the World Mind. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we don't know about that in Guardians, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, Captain Marvel definitely will lead the way in the next phase, whatever that is, because um, a lot of her storyline. Especially now, uh, there's no insider information here, but I think the fact that they have Fox now leaves them open to tell, uh, you know, I have a bunch of books right here uh, dealing with uh, Annihilation, with Annihilus, which they'll probably introduce like in a Fantastic Four movie. There's a big crossover with him. Uh, War of Kings, which dealt with like uh, leaders of all these nations going to war with each other, with which include the Kree Empire, the Scroll Empire, uh, uh, the uh, Inhumans, which I kind of hope Marvel don't give up on. Like redo it, just don't give up on it, because it is a good story to tell. Don't you know? Despite what bullshit we got on ABC. Yeah, if they if they reboot that, that will be you know no one will will shed a tear. Yeah, yeah. but but we'll see we'll see what they mm-hmm. decide to do. Um, but but the the opportunity is um you know they can only do it once. Mm-hmm. And they're, I think they're building up to, towards it. The Kree have always been bad guys. Right. They're the bad guys. We we think for a second that that um, in Captain Marvel they're going to be oh we're going to learn more about the Kree how they're the good guys because they're going against the Skrull who are the bad guys. Mm-hmm. But then the, the the twist, which is so good, the best twist is one where as soon as it happens you go of course I should have known. Mm-hmm. Where the Kree are in fact still bad guys, and the Scroll are on the run and just trying to survive. Right, right. I think that is done so well. Uh, it's, it's a great twist for me, mm-hmm. um, for many reasons. One of which being we don't have to deal with secret invasion or secret war, whatever, whichever secret one. Invasion. Which one? Secret, secret invasion. invasion. Uh-huh. Right. Secret war is the one where they go to Latveria, right? No, secret war is where the Beyonder takes. Uh, pieces of different planets make a whole battle world with it and takes all oh, the okay. villains and heroes and let them fight 
situation. Right. That's phase <laughs> phase six. Um, but fa- uh, um, right. So we'll see if mm-hmm. Secret Invasion ever happens. I it I can still happen. It I can... don't. I don't think it will. I, I, because for years now, for years, I've been going, oh, my God, I don't want to deal with, oh, he was a scroll the whole time. Ugh. Like, they ha- they have not considered that. Uh-huh. They have not written Here's... these characters to be that way. Yeah. If any character who's been introduced before Captain Marvel mm-hmm. is revealed to have been a scroll the whole time, uh-huh. I will cut my own throat. Here's the thing. They won't go that way. Kind of like how Civil War and Age of Ultron are in name only. The Civil uh, Secret Invasion would go that route, where as even in the in the book itself, Secret Invasion, none of the major characters were scrolls in disguise. Like you know, uh, none of them were revealed. Like the whole time they were scrolls, so they they don't necessarily have to go that way with the MCU as well. However, with the reveal, it does put a chink in the armor with the reveal that the, the scrolls were were refugees. But mm-hmm. the window is still open because of what uh, what was the main bad guy's name? Oh well, the main scrolls name. What was Ben Mendelsohn? Yeah, but I forgot his, his. Well, anyway, his character said basically said like in war we had to do dirty stuff as well. Right, yeah. Um, which means that even though they're refugees, they're good guys in the Scroll Empire and bad guys in the Scroll Empire, who have maybe different ideologies than this guy. So that's one. Yeah, I mean, it's also been thirty years or almost thirty years. Yeah. But uh, so so the situation could be different. But like the uh, what I want to see in the future, you know, Captain Marvel or just cosmic in general. Mm-hmm. Is for the Kree to get the depth that they've needed. Like, unless you're really paying attention to mm-hmm. Guardians of the Galaxy mm-hmm. and like Agents of Shield. Yeah, you know what? And Agents, no one pays attention. That's to what I'm that. saying. Agents of Shield could should get a lot more credit, man, because they showed more Kree than the MCU has ever shown. Yeah, but like, but if you pay like, unless you really pay attention to Guardians of the Galaxy and Captain Marvel. You really don't know the Kree beyond space bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like they are that, uh, you know, but but Ronan just represents you know like the Taliban of mm. the Kree. You know, uh, like they've got to be. Like I thought that um, I, I rewatched Guardians one and two back to back recently, mm-hmm. and when I was watching one, I thought that Yondu was supposed to be a Kree. Right, right. But but he's not. Mm-hmm. Like he says in in part two that he was in that he was he mentions his race. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, so I was like, oh, he's not a Kree. I, I, Cause I was watching it with thinking about the Kree mm-hmm. uh, and I was like, oh, see, you know, there's Krees of all different walks of life. And he's like, I'm not a Kree. And I'm like, oh, okay. never mind. Um, mm-hmm. so we got some Kree who don't suck. Right. That's what we need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think the, the, like if I was to sort of have any influence on in it secret invasion would not necessarily be part two of uh captain marvel i would just like C- civil war was part three of captain america i would say C- secret invasion for part two while the second captain Marvel, captain marvel should delve deeper into its own mythology that started with the first one find out more about the kree and Whatever happens with the scroll, maybe something happens with the scroll empire that they hated what she, where, you know, she took them or wherever she took them, but just wasn't safe enough. And they decide, hey, man, I'm just going to take your planet instead of, you know, um, as a matter of fact, there was a in the book itself, the secret invasion. The leader is, uh, is this woman which a lot of people are saying is the daughter of the the main scroll uh, that she could grow up because it's years later she right. grows up um, and it also they have this sort of religion behind them is like oh they, they talk about the god one god he loves you and they go on suicide bombings and, sh- and stuff like that so you could sort of incorporate that into their thinking that earth is their new mecca 
you know, let's lead them to the new Mecca and then sort of like do whatever it takes to hold on to their new Mecca, you know, sort of deal. Hey, it's ways, ways around it. it I mean, that'd be cool. I'm into yeah. that, you know, like there were friends in the past. Now they're enemies. They go back and forth. You mm-hmm. know, war never changes, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm into it. Yeah. So, yeah, Captain Marvel, a good, good introduction to the character. You know, a lot of these haters, it's like a lot of people are picking on Brie. It's like, leave Brie alone, man. It's Brie's like, great. Like, She's everything she fantastic. says is like, you see a, four videos come up about it. Like, the other day she was talking to uh, Chris Hemsworth and basically saying, uh, uh, you know, Chris Hemsworth, because she said she was trying to do her own stunts in the movies. And and Chris said, oh, yeah, you're like Tom Cruise, right? And she's like, oh, uh, I'm... I'm going to be my own person. Thank you very much. I was like, okay, she's just trying to be her own person. And everybody's like, oh, she snapped on on Chris Emsworth. Oh, she was being rude to Chris Emsworth. I was like, Well, it's also like she's down. making a joke. Yeah. It sounds like. And at the same time, Tom Cruise is a crazy person. No, you don't want to be Tom Cruise. This guy, every time he's in a movie... I'm listening out for headlines. Oh, Tom Cruise died on the set of X. Tom and, Cruise. You know, Tom Cruise cuts his hair with a helicopter. Right? A lot of people don't know that, but he does. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, she should definitely try to be her own person. Not Tom Cruise. That guy's a maniac. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, you know, people are going to just pick on her and it's just backfiring because a lot of i think that that even helped her make more money than ever because a lot of people were like yo why are they picking on brie let's support brie right yeah like it's the same it's um if her movie made 250 million Mm dollars they would not be so loud if her movie was dr strange level Mm -hmm. they would not be so loud just like the hatred against Wonder Woman didn't re like it was there, it was definitely yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't like kick into overdrive until it passed Batman v Superman at the box office. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were like, "Oh, it's fine if you play in your in the girl section." Yeah. But as soon as you say, "I'm coming for you," mm-hmm. Batman v Superman, and you pass it, that's when they get mad. Yeah. That's when they get, "Oh, she's playing outside of her her range. She doesn't know her place." Uh, and and they don't even know that like their hatred is just more good good press for the show for the movie. I, you know what makes me even more sad is that, and as much as we saw the the naysayers for Black Panther, it was mainly just white dudes that were talking cr- trash about Black Panther, right? But there was no black person, maybe like one or two. Yeah, uh, uh, can, well, what the hell is it? Candace Owens. Right. Candace Owens is probably the only one. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, there was a, 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 a solid movement for Black Panther. When I'm watching, when I'm see, I've seen a bunch of videos on YouTube, both men and women. Hated on Brie Larson and Captain America and talking about anti-feminist, uh, anti-feminist this and anti-feminist that. I'm like, wow, you hate yourself that much that you're not even happy to see your own self on the screen. And they're doing this, and they're doing the same thing with 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 Discovery. It's like, you should be happy you have Michael Burnham, who is not even a captain. She is a what is she? She's not even she's not even second, right? She's an officer. Yeah. Well, I think no. Does she have a command? Command uh, uh, rank? She, she, she's commander, I, right? Like Commander yeah, Riker. Yeah, Commander com- Riker. Commander Burnham. Yeah. Yeah. But nonetheless, she's not even a captain. She's not even. I mean, she is the main character, but she's not a captain, mm-hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Cisco started as a commander, but by episode three or four, they made him captain. But you have a female, a uh, African American female who's the main character of the show that's not the captain and they're dissatisfied women are against her it's like that is and, and, sad man and that it's not sad. even like like star trek is trying to like shove her female blackness down people's throats no but they say that 
to like create the illusion that it is. Right. And they're not. But like the, the weirdest of all, especially with Star Trek, mm-hmm. like more than more than with any of these, mm-hmm. it's like, what do you think Star Trek has been doing for fifty years? Star Trek is is like the Vulcan. Uh, philosophy is IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Mm -hmm. That goes back to the 60s. Right. That's like the foundation of Vulcan philosophy and like just the theme of Star Trek. Star Trek is a show where the captain had a white guy, a black girl, an alien who looked kind of like Satan, (laughs) a Russian guy, and an Asian guy on the bridge. Yep. That said, the future is global it's diverse. It is every community working together. And if like, how can you even be a Star Trek fan and criticize those themes? What is, what episode of Star Trek have you even watched <laughs> I, that you I, believe this <laughs> nonsense? I don't understand. I don't. It's just. Uh, it's either they're doing it for clickbaity reason, like they really don't believe in this, and they just want to. Uh, appeal to the dumb masses that are that will give them clicks and make them the monies or they really believe this shit which is just oh my god dude like don't don't it's i don't i can't yeah and and like the people who like like star trek is just a space show why is it political and it's like you haven't watched star trek you don't know star trek right either that or you are that dumb that you just all of the positive political messages in star trek just went right over your head and that I think says that's what, a lot about you i think that's what it is i think that i think the only thing they took away from star trek is ooh, borgs evil uh ooh, uh the romulans and the, the, the vulcans are fighting yay uh but yeah. all the sort of nuances of star trek which made up are majority <laughs> yeah yeah i remember that one episode in star trek the next generation that dealt with uh the whole how do you see yourself as a gender where you had Riker who she he fell in love with the androgynous looking alien being and I think in that world you're su- you're supposed to not fall in love or something I forgot that episode but it's just like she know. she saw herself as a woman because she fell in love with Ry- Riker and her, and that was against that whole thing, uh, you know. You know what I'm saying. And even in uh, the Cage episode, where they had, what is it, females doing the voices? Oh no, it was females, but the male. It was all males doing the voices of the female uh, looking alien big head things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was subversion from day one, man. Yeah. Uh, I mean it's. Gene Roddenberry, weird guy, uh, but like yeah, he, he had a a vision of the future. Yeah, yeah he had something there. <laughs> it just needed no, absolutely. it needed other people to elevate it a little bit, <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Uh, but yeah, man, it's just, uh, it, go, he, taking it back to Captain Marvel. It was like I I just hated watching those videos. This is one particular dude that he dedicated a hundred videos about Captain Marvel is like really you have no other thing to do you know what I mean like well he definitely doesn't have a girlfriend you know and th- this thing he's a oh, he looks like he's an older guy that should looks like he would have a wife and kids settling down but he just like comes off as a young stupid nerdy punk who doesn't know any better you know what I mean and it's a, it's it's a shame it is like I hate those headlines. Captain Marvel is ruining the MCU, or Captain Marvel is flop. Captain Marvel is a bomb. It's like, in what world is Captain Marvel a bomb, dude? Yeah. Like, all right, I can't. Um, but yeah, uh, tomorrow's end game for me. Sunday's end game for you. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, be on. Uh, I've got work to do, so I'm gonna be on like internet blackout. Yeah. I'll just be watching some movies and writing. Doing all that stuff. So I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about. When, oh, yeah. Uh, and Endgame comes out. So we can see how this everything gets wrapped up. And even though... Because they say it's the culmination and it feels like a series finale. 
but there are other movies coming out. So yeah, movie coming out like two months later. So we gotta, you know, how much? Which I kind of like. Why would they make Spider Man the ending if this is supposed to be the? You know, it's like looking at from a aesthetic point of view. I, I think Sp- Spider Man is gonna play like its own thing. It's gonna be like it's gonna be much more of Spider Man two. Mm-hmm. than a po- uh, epilogue mm-hmm. yeah, to yeah. Avengers, just sure. because I think that uh, the scheduling-wise with Sony and Marvel, mm. they're kind of like, whatever Marvel is doing, Spider-Man comes out this time. Right, right. We which, don't care if you're at Avengers, which, we don't care if you're which, at whatever. Which makes me think they really should make it beginning of Phase 4 instead of uh, ending of Phase 3. But hey, if Kevin wants it to be ended in Phase 3, more power to him. <laughs> Yeah, I think it'll be like, you know, Ant-Man style kind of here's something to to let you exhale. Yeah, yeah. It's a little extra. A bonus feature of the MCU, of the Infinity Saga. <laughs> and we don't know we don't know what's next, right? After no. Spider-Man? No. Uh What's the date? Is it going to be 2019 or 2020? For for which for, one? For for post Spider-Man. 2020. 2020. Well, you know what? Yeah, twenty. They have untitled. Let me look. They have untitled movies. There's no untitled in 2019, though. No, uh, we are the Spider Man. That's it. Uh, All right, that's good. I mean, I like like it when they let it breathe. Like, and, it was great to wait from Ant Man to Captain Marvel. That's like the longest wait we've had in a little while. Yeah, and and they are not announcing any movie until after uh, Spider Man. I'm okay with that. Yeah, like it'll, it'll happen when it happens. Um, so we gotta wait a long time to hear anything. Um, uh, but I mean, it's it's weird because it's like when in Hollywood, when it comes to casting and uh and hiring directors and and writers and producers, a lot of those that stuff are. It's hard to be kept on the wraps because you know it's so infused with the with 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 people wanting to get word out there that they're working on this project, you know, for business reasons and for uh, promotion reasons. But every once in a while, you get like Blair Witch or the Cloverfield right, Paradox, right? But like but those what, aren't two hundred million dollar movies, right, right? So that's why you're hearing about. Um, the Eternals and the cast members of the Eternals and Black Widow and uh, 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 Shang Chi, Shang Shang Chi. Um, even though we really don't know when they're coming out and it's not officially announced, um, but ooh ooh, Jason Momoa as the Submariner. Well, I think that's uh, the Submariner is tied up with universal so they how probably... weird would it be though if he got that and they just like pretended like that he wasn't playing both of those characters yeah. at the same time <laughs> yeah i know right he's and he like he plays him exactly the same <laughs> you, which is funny because the way how he plays um plays him in aquaman is closer to submariner it's just closer to submariner i mean that's Sub- funny submariner uh, he's a lot more of an asshole namer um, you know, a lot less dude bro, but more of I, st- I don't I care. I still haven't seen that. I still haven't seen Aquaman. Oh, yeah, you should definitely watch it. I it's, know, it's, I gotta. It's it's enjoyable. Um, well, I'm going to my parents' house this weekend, and my dad <laughs> likes Aquaman, so maybe I'll red box it. Uh, so Marvel they they have July 31st, 2020, for an un un uh, an untitled film, and they have. May 1st, which was originally supposed to be Guardians 3, uh, also <laughs> for a, a movie, but we don't know what they're going to put there. Okay. I think Black Wid- Widow, if I had to guess, Black Widow is going to be one of those early films, considering that if I don't think it's going to be a big budget yeah. movie. Black Widow we're getting soon. Yeah. It's, I think Black Widow and Black Panther we're getting soon. Yeah, Black Widow, Black Panther. I think we'll definitely get uh, Shang-Chi because those movies are cheaper to make. I think they want to take a step back after Endgame. <laughs> it's like, let's build build up again. 
I think that's yeah. they're 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 doing their build up again. You, you can't get bigger like. That's why Ant Man always works so well as counter programming. Yeah, because you you don't get burned out. Mm-hmm. You, you can't watch something as big as Endgame right after watching Endgame right. or Infinity War right after watching Infinity War. Mm-hmm. You got to go in the other direction. Yeah, so that's why I think that's why 2017 was the like, even if all three of them are not my three favorite Marvel movies, mm-hmm. that sequence of Guardians, Spider Man, Ragnarok. Mm-hmm. Is just um, a great flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for the MCU. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty, pretty, pretty cool flow, and I think that's what they're. I think that's the way they're gonna approach it, you know, because like, Endgame. I still feel amazed of when when I was watching the uh, the press tour for for Endgame. Uh, granted, it was around the world. It wasn't anywhere in the U.S., but like. I, when they were t- went to want to say Shanghai, they were in a, a a stadium, and the way how they came up it was something that would be you know, reserved for like a musical act. Huh. You know what I mean? The the stage lifting up the Avengers and them looking at seven thousand people in the crowd and the the lights and everything. It was like, that's a that's a concert. That's Beyonce or NSYNC or. Or BTS or, you know, somebody. <laughs> you know, these guys are getting that kind of reception. It's like, this movie is on another level. This probably could be the first 300 opening, 300 million opening weekend. Yeah, I mean, it, there's never been anything like this. You know, we said it with en- with Infinity War. Mm-hmm. They tricked us. You know, they made us think that it was the end. Mm-hmm. But like, we knew it wasn't the end. But we know yeah. that this is the end. This is the Even end. though there's more coming. Yeah. So you they know. they gotta basically they gotta go back to, they're gonna go back to basic which is the the best thing to do go yeah. back to be- basics even if you never get that high again the fact that you go back to basics you can Iron Man four yeah you're just judging the films on the back to basics front you know what I mean I think we're gonna see Iron Man four in Phase four I think we're gonna see it by the end of 2021 I hope. I you know what there's even even say because again we're not spoiling Endgame we don't know anything but say I know nothing say Downey his character dies or something if you go by the comics there's ways to bring back Downey back he'll be the new Jarvis yes <laughs> him, him and Riri yep he'll he'll be like like a Force Ghost Obi Wan Kenobi I but think, as a hologram and I think. Riri Williams, I think the two the two characters that became famous when Marvel did their whole reboot in the comics was Riri and uh, Kamala Khan, which was the new Miss Marvel. Oh yeah, we we haven't even mentioned her, and I don't even like know her that well. Yeah, but I just like her look so much. Mm-hmm. So, I have like a pin a pin from like Marvel Battle Lines or something that right. I got it Comic Con, uh-huh. and I'm like, oh my god, she is like cute as a button. Yeah, so I think. And, I think yeah. the next phases will touch on those two characters, especially Riri I'm, Williams. I mean, I know like nothing about Kamala Khan, but I imagine that she would be introduced in Captain Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which, which is why I think Captain Marvel, the new one, would be set in present day because it has to influence someone now, um, right. somebody who is uh, sort of like enamored by captain marvel to want to... right and kamala is like too young to to have been even around in right 95 right, right. <laughs> so that that would definitely set the, the road for that and then of course uh, we're getting old and then iron man 4 you know you could have, you could do your man you could do the real mandarin but have riri williams have to fight the real if mandarin we do oh my god yes <laughs> have him be dead and being like, ah, oh, I always wanted to fight this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. All right. Um, that should bring us to the end here. Uh, three hours, just like Endgame. <laughs> um, and the secret is you watch it while you you listen to it while you're watching Endgame, and it syncs up perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> perfectly balanced, as all things should be. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. All right, so uh, that brings us to the end. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Uh, hit that like and that notification bell. Drop a comment down below. What's your favorite film? Oh, okay. What's your favorite movie in Phase 3? 
Oh, that's when I asked what's my favorite movie, and I was gonna be like, uh, Billy Jack. <laughs> uh, favorite movie in Phase Three. Ooh, it's pretty close between, like, Civil War is up there, mm. but um, Spider-Man: Homecoming, I, and Guardians Volume Two. They, I think, off the top of my head, those are the three that are fighting for number one. Maybe it's it's just because it's the mo- the one I've watched most recently. But uh, for now, I'm going to give it to Guardians too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's, like I I had mentioned, it was Guardians one for me for the f- longest time for favorite overall until this uh, overtake it Avengers Infinity War overtook it. So I, I guess I mean it's an easy answer because it has everyone in it. But I just love that movie. I watched it, like, so many times. Uh, if I had to give... If something had to battle it, it would be Civil War um, uh, being the f- uh, favorite. Um, because, like I said, Volume 2 wasn't uh, as good to me as Volume 1. Uh, you know what? Another one would be Spider-Man that could fight for it. Because uh, I think that's a perfect movie, Spider-Man Homecoming. It's 10 out of 10. Yeah, it's a perfect movie. Uh, uh, Thor Ragnarok I love the idea that it turned it into this brand new thing um, uh, versus the other two but and I love it for what it is but Spider-Man affected me more um, than that movie so I give it to Spider-Man but um, yeah so Avengers Infinite War for me for Phase 3 is my favorite um, and I can't wait to see the conclusion yeah all right so uh you can follow me on instagram at uh pop culture galaxy and follow uh on me on facebook at pop culture galaxy and uh follow me on twitter at marky tundra where can they reach you zach you can find me on twitter at my name zach wozner although i won't be tweeting much until i see the movie because i'm gonna go on media blackout um and on instagram at zach woz i put pictures of myself and sometimes food mm-hmm. and cats and just random things I see. Right. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. And uh, um, like I said, so hit that subscribe button. So until next time, folks, peace. Indeed. Yeah. Nice. All right. I got to go. All right, I'll talk to you later.